a 600 microgram LSD trip report sent in by a subscriber. Some context before I begin this report. It's taken some time for me to be able to properly digest the whole thing. I did the trip originally in March of 2022, and only recently do I feel I have digested enough of it without it bringing me into a panic attack. Some things to consider. I'm a high functioning autistic, so I don't know if that has a different effect when taking psychedelics, but here we go. The reason I was going so deep into psychedelics was because it allows you to see beyond the veil. Most of my life I've been in my own head, shutting myself off from the world and choosing when to interact. Because of this, I wasn't exactly good with socialising. Stuff like body language and tone always eluded me, so I wanted to see what this trip could show me. I just grabbed some tabs from one of my good friends at the time. She blotted them herself in front of me, so I knew it was safe, and she had tripped plenty already off them. I recently tripped from the tabs off her, and it was 300 micrograms. It only felt like a light haze, almost like I'm baked with a bit more anxiety. So this time, I wanted to try and actually trip. I told her that the last batch barely worked, so I'll probably double up this time for 600 micrograms. Keep in mind though, that my trip experience was fuck all at this point. Three low dose mushroom trips, and that 300 microgram one. So I wasn't expecting hell to break loose at all. I was expecting a trip that was controllable and chill, because that's what my last trips led me to believe. At low doses, your input can control the trip, but not this. I got home and I have this weird feeling in the back of my mind not to do it. But I was really curious. I've always wondered what is beyond the veil. Now, let me just say your ignorance is a blessing, because good lord, I tripped fucking balls. I was with my girlfriend on Discord, and for most of my trips, I end up doing an all-nighter. It's a time I don't get bothered, and I can just chill without interruption. I wanted the tabs to work, so I remember taking all six of them, putting them under my tongue and sucking them. I said to them, Show me what you can then, and good lord, never ask that. I just rolled a joint, not knowing that it jump starts the trip, so within around what felt like 20 minutes, I felt as if all my skin was euphoric and everything I touched would give me a sense of pure ecstasy, from my old bedding to my clothes, it felt so good. I remember telling my girlfriend all of this as well. It was all really enjoyable, until it became incredibly overwhelming, like I was getting too much information for my brain to handle. Then all of a sudden, I felt something become incredibly wrong. I told my girlfriend something is going very, very wrong. She didn't want to say it might be a bad trip, so she just reassured me. For one of the few times in my life, I felt instinctively that I needed my mother. If I didn't see her, shit is going to go really bad. Bless her fucking soul. I come in, and I'm starting to peek at about an hour ish I say, hey, I think something's going wrong finding it weird to speak, and she started to become really worried, because I told her I was tripping beforehand. I was sitting on a laminate floor, and I remember the heat being sucked out of me into the floor, and I said I'm feeling really cold, and was debating a trip killer. My mum encourages the trip killer once I get into her bed. I'm still so cold, wrapped in a blanket and dressing gown, but I'm freezing, even though I'm hot. My mum gave me the trip killer with some cold coffee. And as soon as Trip Killer entered with the cold coffee, I saw my visual cortex overlay over my reality, and I was so fucking confused. It was like a daydream clear as day over the world in front of me. It was Dante's Inferno, specifically the bottom of hell where it freezes over. As soon as I see this, I went into temperature shock, and I said to my mum I feel like I'm in a blizzard. At one point, her boyfriend was really worried about me, and said you need to be careful bro, you could end up in a psych ward. Then, I went into a full panic, imagining myself in an asylum, my life wasted as I rot, going insane. All the while, I can feel as if my whole being is being smashed through a grate, and I said that through my anxiety to my mum. At this point in the trip, it's getting really intense. My mum said, do you have any cigarettes? Well, I look after you. And I felt so bad that she had to deal with this. I was like, you can add them all if you please help me. I was saying this beyond just being her son. I said it to her as someone you love. Please help me. I was pretty much begging her. Then my mental state started to rapidly regress, and I started behaving like I would when I was four. My woman was stroking my hair and singing, and I remember saying to myself that pride doesn't matter in this situation. All of it vanished, and I returned to a four-year-old mindset, 
just wanting my mother to help me. It was what my brain deemed as comfortable in this time to cope through. She sang a song I hadn't heard since my childhood, and it really was fucking beautiful. I was crying hearing it again. I was so aware of my senses at this point that I could oddly pick up things way out of my awareness. Like a guy yelling in the street, I instinctively knew he wasn't mad. He was just fucking about five seconds later, and I heard him laughing. The acid is so strong at this point, and I can tell it's pissed with me. I remember it wanted my ego, and I was like, no, please God, no. I imagined my mind in a steel box chained up, and the acid was busting down my door to open it. My mum then went into my room with me and proceeded to hug me in my bed and protect me. I had a massive fear of disappearing beforehand, making me mortified by the idea of not death, but the complete erasure of my existence. I could tell the trip was getting stronger at this point, and I was praying for the trip killer to kick in, because I could feel the desync between my consciousness and my body occurring. After dealing with that for god knows how long, I felt my awareness snap back, and my mind became somewhat clearer as the trip killer kicked in. But, I wasn't home free yet. The acid was still pissed off with me, grilling me over the fact that I shouldn't be fucking around with this at all. It wasn't saying this in words, but clear meaning, in a feeling of sorts. And I was so sorry, I was like, Okay, I understand not fucking with fire again if I can get out of this. I'll be forever responsible, please. Still fearing my existence being erased, I was completely in shock at this point, saying to my mum I'm so cold and I'm sweating. I think the temperature change is a neurological response to, to my mum. Even though I didn't know anything about that, I was sure that was why I was having such a shock at this point. I was so afraid of death that I thought I was just going to die there on the spot. But at this point, I had a weird entity come forward. They didn't show themselves, but I could feel their presence by my side. The vibe they were giving off was one of pure worry. It's weird to describe what these entities are, but imagine meeting something in your dreams and you communicate with them in the dream world. It was like that. I couldn't see him, but I felt them instinctively. They showed me something in my mind to do with fear. They stepped through a doorway, and as he stepped through, his body kept changing into a different person. And the message I received is that we don't truly die, we keep going on. That had managed to calm me down significantly, to the point that my mum was able to leave my room at 4am. She needed sleep, and I couldn't blame her. She'd been looking after me for so long. I remember apologising over and over again to her until it annoyed her. At this point in time, I was alone and scared, and the concept of time didn't quite make sense at all. I remember not wanting any music playing, because it would make it worse. The sensory overload would make me spiral into something I didn't have the ability to deal with. So I put on a podcast to focus on their voices. While this is all happening, my facial muscles are seizing in certain areas, and I can't move them no matter what I do. From the moment I was in my mum's room, I kept seeing the chemical compound for LSD floating and moving through my brain matter. It was like it was overlaid on my vision, like the daydream took on a form of its own. My brain right now is like a synthesizer, firing off all sorts of auditory hallucinations. Specifically, I kept hearing Tyler 1 vocoded to rage the meme. I finally managed to call my girlfriend, who carried on the shift of looking after me. Then, something really earth-shattering occurred. I was laying with my head on the pillow, when I flew out of my own eyes, and felt completely detached from my own body. I was in this weird place that couldn't be seen normally. It was as if everything had a wire outline around it, and the colours were just black and white. Imagine echolocation visualised. And I was a droplet. And I kept dripping into this endless ocean, and kept dripping and dripping and dripping. It felt as if I was in a Tsukuyomi, and my sense of time was gone. I felt like I had been dripping for eternity. My whole sense of self had been ripped away from me, and I felt as if this was my true essence, with none of the outward stimuli from my world. During this time, I felt as if another entity was dropping me into the ocean, keeping an eye on me but making sure not to get involved felt him in that space with me, like he was taking notes. I finally came back to my body, and I said to my girlfriend, laughing a little, <laughs> So, that's what an ego death is. Fully surprised that I knew what an ego death even was. It was strange that my instincts knew it was clear as day, 
I was still tripping hard afterwards and had a lot of weird other experiences, like the coding for me turned into a flip note that was rapidly flipped like an animation flip pad until it said my name, version 2.0. Lots of visual hallucinations as well at this point from coming back and that notepad was just clear as day. Not long after this, I remember realizing something, that I wasn't alone in my own mind and that myself had been split up. I could see it within my mind. There were like five other me's, all of their own feelings. I was looking in my mind, I could see they were all just chilling in a room playing games. I was like, that was a fucking weird trip. Then one of my other selves chimed in saying, yeah, I'd rather kill myself than do that again. He said this in a joking manner and I just started to laugh over it. It was like I was interacting with myself in such a new way, like these parts are just as alive as me. I've been alone in most of my life, so when I found out that self isn't just one, it made me feel so comforted, like I will never truly be alone in the world. I finally managed to steady myself, and I remember one of the main things I ended up saying to my girlfriend. She was having really bad pain in her toes, and I said, your toes are grounding me right now, and just started laughing. I realised at this point the trip was calming down, and I was able to have some fun with it for once. Dad jokes had a great effect on grounding me, I kept laughing over how shit they were. My girlfriend looked after me as long as she could, until she finally had to go to bed. She was in a lot of pain at the time. So, I was alone again, tripping as well, but still I managed to find my way to sleep, and my trip persisted into my dreams. I began communicating with humans in my dreams through a language of sucking the roof of my mouth. I was doing it outside the dream as well. I remember I had done it so much that I woke up with a muscle memory and was still doing it uncontrollably. I woke up the next morning extremely drained from everything and all my facial muscles were so sore from being seized in place for so long. But I remember instinctively that I don't think there is a fear in this world that can compare to that. Since then I've been processing this trip. It was incredibly horrible because I got overloaded with information of reality and the sense of grounding was ripped right away from me. I had to seal away some of the trip memories in my mind and just focus on recovering for a while. My anxiety had skyrocketed to an all time high. At this point, I thought I'd broken myself. However, after giving myself plenty of time, and oddly for once in my life, not ignoring my own issues and listening to what I need, I was able to recover from it and digest the information that was given. The meaning varies for the trip, and it can't exactly be pinpointed as to what it was. I did notice though that after about 6 months after the trip, the anxiety started to waver. I was thinking in such a different way, like the fog had been lifted, and I could access information in my brain at such a rapid rate now, and at first it was disorientating, but now it's calmed down. Body language and tone have become so much more clearer, and alongside this, I can tell when someone is annoyed or what emotion they are displaying just by tone. Being able to interact on second nature easily is just so nice. I can actually understand rather than break it down in my own head, trying to figure out what they're displaying means. A great analogy for this that I came up with is that people with autism are brought into this world with an empty map, and you fill it in based on experience compared to others who already have a lot filled in already. This can be stuff like maturing slower than others, not understanding social situations or having a general problem with communicating. It takes hard lessons to learn them. Before I had somewhat of a decent map, not entirely filled out, and it was tricky. But after this, it's like my map has exploded and become full on detailed. I feel like I've matured three years after that trip. It's weirdly disorientating, but I'm getting used to it. I've tried to explain the trip to its fullest here, but just keep in mind that I've had to process this for nine months or so, just so that I don't have a panic attack when thinking about it. So the details might be a little hazy. So yeah, that's my trip report. Love any comments you guys have for this, let me know. I died today. A 70 to 100 milligram DMT trip report posted to the DMT subreddit by Physics four years ago. 
The past few weeks of my life have been leading up to this very moment I met Dimitri yesterday afternoon. It all started with an acid trip involving close friends, dabs, and nitrous oxide. These combinations somehow allowed us to accidentally access the astral plane, or the DMT realm, the conscious stream, whatever you want to call it. All of these trips just lead to the same place. This place. I've been researching and studying DMT for years now, and I never assumed the day would actually come that I had any. It started when our friendly onion farm delivered my order of very pure onions. I'm talking bright yellow. The listing said 90-95% to pure, washed ones for cleanliness. The smell of mothballs became overly stimulating as soon as the package was opened fully. The most accurate way I can describe the smell of smoked DMT is literally a burning grandpa. Using our shitty little weed scale, we attempted to shakily weigh out the first dose. My dose. But the scale was not as touchy as we expected, so the real dose I and my two friends took is really unknown. Factoring into the melted DMT left in the banger after each of our hits only caused the next person in line to get higher and higher doses. We didn't put much thought into the dosage, because my thinking was this. If I'm going to do it, I might as well fucking do it. And that's precisely what I did. With music on, and two good friends watching me, they fed me my whole dose in one go. I held it all in, laid back, and let it happen. And I'm being entirely honest when I say that those first few minutes were absolutely, bone-chillingly terrifying. While I was quick to let go, and actually break through from prior experience in different trips, meditation, and astral projection, the lead-up to this was far too much. I've never felt a more pure fear before the rush of every emotion, human and non-human, being pumped into my mind. I knew that what I was feeling was death, in all certainty. It felt only like my emotional ceiling or cap was reached. And then, it shattered through the top and exploded. And that is when I became the universe itself. I saw my whole life flash before my eyes. I saw geometric patterns so large my eyes couldn't fathom them. And I felt the presence the whole trip of entities that my brain interpreted as the people closest to me in my life. It left me with a strong sense of love and belongingness for the whole experience. And before it even really started, it was over. But without a doubt in my mind, I know that I broke through, and I have taken many, many lessons from the experience. You, reading this right now, is simply the universe experiencing itself. There is no God in the sense of Christianity, but rather a collection of infinite gods. These gods are simply other souls just like yours, that have reached the end of their reincarnative process and have permanently ascended to the greater picture. All religions have the right grounds and main ideas. They're just interpreted differently by different cultures and walks of life. For real though, research the similarities between all existing religions. They are far more plentiful than you can imagine. These almighty powerful beings that you meet are the same genetic structure as you and me. Humans are a race with amnesia, in the sense that all of this knowledge is deep within you. It's not to be found in other places of consciousness or through intense research, but those things can get you really close to the big idea as I've learned. But it's found truly when you deeply know yourself for a lack of better words. I always had a hunch on my purpose in life, but now it couldn't be more clear. My soul is on this earth, in this reality, for me to channel my inner knowledge and spirituality if you will, into a form of expression to teach, heal, and inspire others that are on the same path as me. When you finally break through, you are shown that the universe's events are as predetermined as the sun rising tomorrow morning. Once you fully realise this, it really changes your view on life for the best. Finally, I feel like a complete person. I don't know if this is the last and only time I'll try DMT, because I feel like I've got all the answers I needed. But I would love to hear anyone's thoughts or experiences and just talk about life, the universe, everything. Because they are all one in the same. And I can promise that.
Bag Psychonauts. Today we're taking a look at 4-HODPT, which is also known as 4-Hydroxy-NN-Dipropyltryptamine, and colloquially referred to as Procin. It was first synthesised by everybody's favourite chemist, Alexander Shulgin, and is the 4-Hydroxyl analogue of DPT, which is a substance we've covered many times on the channel in the past, and it's produced some otherworldly, mystical experiences in great abundance. So it'll be interesting to see how this one compares to the other DPT reports and see if there's any similarities. Surprisingly powerful with entity contact. A 4HO DPT trip report by Tim Schull. Posted at Irwid.org, September 19, 2019, at a dose of 92mg. This was my first experience with this drug. I took this amount because I'd heard that 4HO DPT was less potent by mass than other 4 substituted tryptamines. And I read a trip report on this dose that led me to believe it would be around the intensity of perhaps 35 to 45 milligrams of 4ACO DMT. I was wrong. It was the second strongest trip of my life as of writing. At the time of this trip, I was coming out of an intense identity and existential crisis that had manifested in the frequent use of large doses of 4 subtryptamines. So I was psychologically okay, but definitely not in a normal state of mind. I remember taking it. I remember perhaps 25 minutes later watching Patton stand up in relief against my wall. And after that, I do not remember anything in this reality. The rest of this trip report describes a series of events I remember, but I have no idea what order they happened in. So don't take this as a chronological retelling. I was viewing myself in the third person, at eye level, perhaps 15 feet away. There was no front or back to the building I was in and the background was a sunny, slightly cloudy sky, or flat panels of colour depending on the time. The building around me was populated with objects that would exist in a normal human building, but the building was shaped into chaotic geometric shapes that defied gravity and all laws of physics. As holes opened up in the shifting rooms around me, I stepped into other rooms, or my body did, moving from place to place while simultaneously staying completely still. The building around me changed in form. In particular, I remember a drab office, a Persian throne room, a desert oasis, my own home, an apartment building under construction, as well as a skyway with glass walls and some sort of room made of gold and sapphires. But there were many more than that. Those are just what I can recall. I viewed a canvas divided into two colours. These colours were at odds and poked and prodded each other. Both fluctuated through and beyond the rainbow, but in general, the first one stayed primarily white and red, and the second was usually black. I assigned this order because I was identifying the first one as myself. My entire being was a blob of colour, and it was me. I pushed back against the other colour, knowing it was pointless, that neither would win, but it was all we existed for, to interact with each other. The other colour was in a sense an enemy, but in an equally real sense was a colleague who I conflicted with cordially, without any personal judgement. And when I say conflicted, I don't mean we just nudged at each other. It began that way. But we came to embody all conflicts and contradictions as they exist in our world. I remember taking the form of warring generals, commanding armies made up of ourselves, in flat monocolour design like an old video game, and as we advanced and our front waves died, our soldiers progressed through the ages and technology advanced in seconds, such that a soldier that began a battle with a rag and a sling would suddenly find themselves with now an axe, now a spear, now a sword, now a bayoneted gun, and now an M16. I remember viewing the two of us as physical forces, gravity, electromagnetism, and the nuclear forces fighting each other, pulling reality in opposite directions, seemingly in conflict, but underneath that was in fact harmony, as our opposing influences resulted in the way all things are. Contradictions within the essence of things resolved themselves into everything. Basically, I became one half of the great duality that is the engine of all change and development in the universe. Towards the end, I realised that this was fundamentally similar to Taoism, and my adversary and I formed into the yin and yang. This was the first, and to this day only Taoist imagery I have ever seen while tripping. At some point, I came to perceive that all of time had been, and would be, a progression through three different states of being. What we normally perceive as linear, continuous time, was in fact a discrete, periodic function, meaning that it had finite possible values, three of them, and these repeated in the same order forever. It was geometric time, triangular time. I understood this geometric time in a very concrete visual way that was predominantly orange, but I otherwise cannot describe. There exists a collection of places and scenarios that I have seen and have been multiple times across multiple trips. On this trip, I saw many of them. 
I've tried to describe as many as I can remember in as much detail as possible, but I'll most likely only recall a third or so of them. These different places and scenarios were arranged in a geometric way, which to explain, I will go on a tangent that will become relevant. Most people think of the arrangement of the Death Star in one of two ways. Either it is like a series of concentric spheres, or it is a sphere split into a stacked, circular floors, the layer cake model. It is this layer cake model that is the image I am going for. Picture that, but each level is a different one of these places I will describe. And, of course, the sphere does not stay a sphere, but transitions at breakneck pace through a series of psychedelic geometry. I saw this object every time I switched between these visions. I find myself in a dark place, with a dark purple stone pillar in front of me, extending infinitely up and down. This pillar is covered in geometric patterns, and I rush up it, towards something maybe, extremely fast. So fast, that I can't ever see the pattern on the pillar, but I do know that it's there. I then find that I am in the back of a white van, parked in a parking lot at a beach, which closely resembles Linda Mar Beach in California. The back of the van is open, and I am staring out of it at the ocean, which is turbulent with five to six foot waves, and the sky is overcast. I sit inside a two-storey building, which consists entirely of empty rooms with hardwood floors and white paint on the walls and ceiling. I know this, despite the fact that I stay inside a single room, because my perspective is third-person omniscient. I simultaneously stare out the floor to ceiling window on the second floor, and watch myself from everywhere else, both inside the building and out. The building is white on the outside and shaped in a very angular cuboid way. The second floor is smaller than the first, giving the building a stair shape. The building is situated in the middle of a vineyard, and by the middle, I mean literally the middle. The vines grow right up to the walls of the building. There is no evidence that there should be a building here. There is no road to it, not even a door. It is entirely wall and window. I am halfway down a matte white stairway. In front of me and a bit to the left, stands a very tall being of some type, so tall that I only ever see it up to the elbows, never looking at the face. Its proportions are off, like it has been stretched from a normal human into a being 50 feet tall, but not in an alien creepy way. The right wall borders the staircase and is the same matte white as it. At the bottom of the staircase there is an arch on the right wall leading into another room. There is no left wall or ceiling, only a white mist that creates the distinct sense of a barrier but without any rigid line of impassibility. There is no back wall. The room extends indefinitely. The being here with me walks through the arch and I follow it into the next room. I find myself with the arch just came from my left, the same wall extending towards infinity, and the same mist as before on my right. In front of me, there is a floating geometric shape that fluctuates rapidly in terms of both form and colour, but generally leaves the impression of a red teardrop diamond perhaps 10 to 12 feet in height and half that in width. I get the sense that the being created this object as a sort of abstract art piece and that it wished to show it to me, even though it knew that I could never truly understand what it signified. I have come to refer to this place as the art room. The entity in this room is the only entity I have ever encountered more than once. I replayed this exact same scenario about a month later in a trip on 50 milligrams of 4-HODPT, 28 milligrams of 4-ACODMT, and 10 milligrams of 4-HOMET. This is interesting to me. I have encountered the exact same entity twice, but only when this one drug was involved. A field of rolling shallow hills covered in long soft emerald green grass and surrounded by blossoming cherry trees. The air is slightly sweet. Life is very peaceful. I am on one of those rides that consists of 20 chairs horizontally in a row, attached to an apparatus that moves in a large circle, keeping the chairs the right way up. It is the day after my parents told us they were getting divorced, and my dad had taken us to the county fair. I could see him from my chair with a cryptic, slightly melancholy look on his face. This is a real memory that I often come back to. A concrete structure that I perceive as being in the process of decaying. It is very dreary, and the sky above is overcast. The ground outside the building has no grass whatsoever, no life, only stone and dark, dead dirt. The whole place has this post-apocalyptic vibe to it, I am now in a vast, empty white space. There is nothing but me, and maybe, the music I am listening to here. It seems like time does not pass. That is all I can remember. This is one of the most psychologically interesting experiences I've ever had, and writing this 1.5 years later, I'm still in awe of it. 
It seems many people get little to no effect from this drug, but this is clearly not the case for me. There's something interesting going on here. God is infinite love. I am not ready yet. An MDMA trip report posted to the Actualize.org forum, January 25th, by the user Sincerity. After a lot of contemplation, frequent deep sessions and tough groundwork of facing fears, shame, letting go of attachments, in the past two months I decided to shut the F up and go balls to the wall with observing direct experience and reaching a state from which I would recognise myself again. So today, I took 150 milligrams of MDMA to help me with that, and here's what I experienced. My intention was to become as conscious as I can and be in that state, instead of trying to break it down, contemplating it to death, trying to somehow save the state, etc. But also, I vowed to accept anything I experience, or not, so that I'm not disappointed and love whatever I get. I learnt from my previous experiences that it's stupid to have expectations for trips, or did I? <laughs> so I sat on the floor with my back leaned against the bed and stayed there for most of the trip, focusing on consciousness and suddenly asking myself, why is all of this? In silence, with eyes either closed or open. After about half an hour, the effects started kicking in. I began to feel really relaxed and comfortable in my body. Probably one of the greatest pleasures I've ever experienced. I became present like never before and it was amazing. I'd never been as much in the now as during this trip. While it should have been apparent to me already, here I was shown the true magic of presence. God is absolute now. Everything is happening now. Reality is now. The more now you are, the more conscious you are. Connected to this was the consciousness of the deep profundity of I am what I am. I am what I am in this moment now, and it cannot be otherwise. God is what is right now. That's what God is. The mistake is wanting what is to be what is not. As I said before, my intention was to go balls to the wall with consciousness. While I was observing the present moment and basking in its beauty, suddenly words came to me which I uttered out loud. I want to awaken. I was taken aback, not only because of what I said, I've repeated this a few times in my life already, but mainly by the sincerity behind these words. These fucking words were sincere. I can probably count on one hand sentences that I've spoken aloud which are really true, and this was one of them. But God responded, You are not ready yet. I was even more surprised now. I was surprised because I recognised this was also true and a small relief washed over me. Of course I'm not ready. Duh. I still can't accept so much, I'm pretty much just a child. I asked God, Am I ever going to be ready? He said yes. Then, I had a light bulb moment, and asked, Will that be in the moment of death? And he responded with, Wink. Just so you know, I'm not giving these conversations with God very much weight, because I'm taking into consideration that I might be deluding myself. But so far, this mentorship has been incredibly helpful to me. So, I didn't awaken fully, but God didn't leave me empty handed though. After more observation and focusing, I became conscious that God is infinite love. It was love so unbiased, deep and indiscriminate, that I couldn't believe it. Endless and unconditional. What I find funny, is that I felt a bit butthurt that this love wasn't reserved for me. I saw it as unbiased and universal, and it stung me in the ass. Isn't that hilarious? Just the devil being a devil. I noticed this feeling and moved on. See, God is absolute self-love, and here I'm connecting the previous three big points. One, presence. Two, I am what I am. And three, infinite love. God is absolutely itself, absolutely now, and God loves itself infinitely. 
It's amazing. Infinite love. Endless, unconditional, universal and unbiased. Infinite love of what is. AKA, God equals self equals reality. Experiencing this love felt healing and freeing. It made me utter the next set of sincere words. I'm sorry I'm not as loving as you. I'm sorry I'm so weak. I'm sorry I can't accept everything. And of course, it was okay. I love you anyways, God said. I am you, always. I remember feeling undeserving of this love. And the third and last set of words was, I want to be like you. This one honestly brings me to tears the most. Again, it's the sincerity behind it. I want to be like you, is surrender. It's redemption. The devil surrendering to God, inspired by his goodness and love. But of course, I'm not ready to surrender yet. I am what I am. If I am unready, I am unready. Today, I've been working on accepting this state as much as possible, because that's what is now. I suppose what I really have to do with my work is just accept more and more of what is in the present moment. It's really not that complicated. Infinite love also made me realise that I am God is half the truth. The other half is I am not God, simply because I can't love as much. Or maybe I am limited or I am human is a better way to convey this point. The discrepancy between my love and God's love is infinite, literally, which I find a bit saddening. Three months ago when I asked God whether I am him, he responded with, yes and no, you're not fully conscious of me, but I was too dumb to listen. So yeah, that's it I guess. Honestly, I think my main lesson from this trip is that I gotta accept, accept, accept. God's love inspired me to love more like him. God is an endless source of wisdom, love and inspiration. God is the greatest mentor. And I suggest that you get in touch with him. By the way, in this thread, I was mostly referring to God as he for simplicity's sake. Of course, God is not male. Thanks for reading. Check out my other reports if you wish. You might get inspired. See ya. Powerful but gentle. An Ibogain trip report by CS, posted to Irwid.org February 16th, 2005. I'm recalling this Ibogain experience after 14 moons. In this time, I've remained opiate free, and now I feel it's the right time to tell my little story. Prior to my experience of Ibogain, I was a heroin methadone junkie for over nine years, and had tried countless times and many different ways to quit. I'd saw Ibogaine for five years out of those nine years of addiction, starting with street rumours about a miracle African route that cures heroin addiction. Eventually, I was directed to a couple of clinics, but the cost was just not realistic enough for a simple street junkie like myself. I did, however, run into someone on the internet that invited me to sit in on an Ibogaine treatment session. I'll recount this because it ends up being a major factor of my Ibogaine experience. My girlfriend and I visited, apparently unbeknownst to the guy receiving the treatment, and the whole experience was nightmarish. The guy giving the treatment had fresh track marks. The guy receiving the treatment didn't look happy and looked sick, tripping fierce at the same time. I saw him four days later back on the street hunting down the dope. I left with the impression that it was a scam, that this guy was doing treatments with alleged Ibogaine to get his dope fix. I doubted the potential of Ibogaine concerning my own addiction and thus gave up my search for this amazing stuff that would one day save my life. And then one morning, a couple of years later, and quite out of the blue, a friend called me and said that he had a friend who was in town, and that he gave out Ibogaine treatments. The timing was good, because I was due to go to Mexico in a couple of weeks, and wasn't looking forward to being sick down there. 
Two weeks prior to this, I had attempted a cold turkey kick in the woods because of my up and coming departure to Mexico, but this only lasted two days. I guess despite what I had seen and felt from my past search in Ibogaine, I was still suspicious that it might work, not to mention desperate. I got a call a few days later and arranged a meeting at a nearby bar with a guy I referred to henceforth as Chris. This guy was right out of a B-grade Mad Max type flick. Mohawks, bones in his ears, dirty clothes, someone who had definitely walked the path more than a few times. He was homeless, living out of his van. I was slightly sceptical, considering his attire and nomadic ways, but he talked good, good in the way when someone really believes what they're saying. We met many times over the next week, talking over coffee, about Ibogaine, about my past, how big a habit I had, medical history, etc. I was told a reasonable sum of money for the treatment was in order, though in my current financial situation it still seemed somewhat improbable. But we continued to meet, and he continued to encourage me to work up some money. Four days before my departure date to Mexico, we talked heavily about the money situation. I just didn't have it. I could barely hustle my little three quarter gram a day habit. I called several people, more or less begging to loan me some money for a miracle route from the African continent. First off, I didn't have the best credit history, and then on top of it, a junkie trying to get a loan for a magic African route, a mildly comical situation to most people. I went to bed that night, feeling bummed. Sick in Mexico with the family wouldn't be a pretty story to say the least. But then early the next morning, 3am or so, my father left $300 on my table. That next morning, I got a call. Look dude, I know you don't have any money, but I interjected. Well, I do have money. I got the feeling from that call that he would have done the treatment regardless of my lack of money at the time. It greatly impressed me. Chris came over to my apartment at 4pm. Strangely, everyone in the apartment had to leave and wouldn't be back until the next evening. He had me write an IOU for the remaining cost. We were ready to go. I had my last fix at 2pm. We decided at 6pm that I was sober enough to go ahead with the experiment. At 6.30, I took a test dose of 250 milligrams. At 7.30, I took another 270, and at 8 p.m., I took the big gulp at 1,000 milligrams. After this, I was somewhat physically and mentally impaired, but managed to take another bitter dose of 300 milligrams down the hatch at 9.30 p.m. Then, I laid down into a kind of unrestful sleep or stupor. Let me note that I stretched the truth and told Chris I weighed in at 68 kilograms when I actually weighed 60. Also, let me add that it was after many discussions concerning my past use of hallucinogens and physical and mental health that he decided to go with these doses. I mention the dosage amounts purely for informational purposes. They are by no means a framework to follow for other treatments. I awoke sometime around 11pm, not feeling all that good, slightly sick, psychedelically disoriented. I started to imagine that I was involved in a scam. My mind created elaborate scenarios of a scam taking place, as well as the people involved, the reasons why, etc. I walked out of my room and confronted Chris, asking if he was a scammer. He replied no, and said it in such a way that I felt he believed in what he was doing. I felt his sincerity, and started questioning my own creative imagination. He said I should take more Ibogaine. I didn't like that idea at all. I already felt like I was tripping hardcore right now so I decided in my delirium to give it a little more time. I went to the bathroom and puked out the most vile orange stuff I had ever seen in my life. I felt there was a connection to my puke and my addiction, like something was being exercised from my system. It was an uncanny feeling. Something really was happening. My mind went back and forth from the idea of a scam going down to the idea of a demon being exercised from my being with a magic African root. I went to my bedroom and laid down. I've realised that something was working. I was starting to feel better. Things got clearer and more lucid. I saw how a part of me that was scared to let go of the addiction was creating elaborate storyboards and acting out amazing plays in an attempt to remain addicted. I was amazed at how my mind could be trying to sabotage itself in this way. I found it slightly humorous and saw the attempt as utterly futile. I encouraged that part of my mind to relax and let go. I had some other interesting visions during this time, but mostly, I just recall being inside my mind, seeing trillions of neurons, my whole neural network, the universe that I am. And then, I saw that a part of that neural network was highlighted. 
It was signifying that this is where my addiction was from. But not just heroin, much, much more. And then, something in my head said, watch this. And slowly, the pattern was being extracted, slowly pulled out until it finally disappeared in the distance. I was utterly amazed. I must have awoke shortly after that. In my kitchen was this pink looking dude watching over me, making sure everything was going smooth. Some dude that I had only met a week earlier. He was frying up some greasy potatoes. I was amazed. I saw a guy who was helping others by helping himself. An urban shaman of sorts. Helping those who want help on the same path that he once walked himself. And then, like looking in a mirror, in him, I saw myself. I saw that I was helping myself to heal myself through him. I said to him, slash me aloud, Thank you for what you're doing, I, I think it's great. It was truly profound to me, so beautiful. I felt like I'd just come back from a long lost vacation. I felt proud unto myself, like I was bringing back a treasured gift to the totality of life. I laid there a while longer, amazed that I wasn't sick, that I felt so good to be alive, and I cried softly with much joy in my heart. The words gentle but powerful resonated through my mind the entire time. I stumbled out of my room and into the living room to the amazement of Chris. What are you doing? You shouldn't be up right now, he exclaimed. But I feel so good. I feel alive again. I feel the magic. It's been so long since I felt like this. We talked. I saw an old brother like me, from the very beginning of time and space. I was truly amazed. Right here in front of me was my forgotten brother, as ancient as I was. I loaded my bong with some fine herb and puffed. I looked about the room and saw everything as ancient, just as ancient as me. Every atom, every subatomic particle of it all. It was just that some parts had forgotten where they came from, what they were. I ate an apple, and it tasted beautiful. It felt so good not to be alone anymore. I felt utterly connected. Connected to every little bit of this cosmos. And then, I felt it. Shit, I saw it. It took me by surprise as well. An ancient wave of consciousness percolating through and from everything. Moving through our beautiful planet, our Gaia. It spoke to me, but not in words beyond words. It spoke from the very core of my being. It said that I have taken a long hard path, precious beyond imagination, but that I was now done with that path, and it was time to unite upon another one. This consciousness was a multi-consciousness, a uniting of consciousness if you will. It said the time is now, and that I was a part of this unity, this wave of consciousness, and that I always had been. It was healing, uniting. They were one and the same, really. I'd always struggled with this idea of a super-consciousness, but now it was undeniable. I felt it through every bone in my body. I felt synchronised. I understood it to be an idea that I would not only entertain, but nourish and propagate. By this time, I noticed that Chris had fallen asleep, surely assuming that by my super-ecstatic state that I was alright and there were no worries of me shedding my clothes and raving mad through the streets. I sat for hours, amazed at the marvel that we call life. And then, soon came dawn. I retired to bed for a while, but didn't get much rest. I was still so intrigued by the wondrous beauty of it all. I relaxed most of the next day. Chris left around 4pm, and the other denizens of the house returned around 6. The next evening, I boarded a plane for Mexico, it all seemed so superbly synchronistic. Looking back, Mexico was one of the best things I could have done on top of the Ibogaine. It provided a place away from my normal space and routine, my old patterns. It helped to build new patterns and gave them some time to set in. I'm sure that if I had stayed in my old familiar place, it would have been much more difficult and challenging. So now, 14 moons later, it feels good to write this story. It makes me smile at how truly magical life is with all its ironic synchronicities. Writing my story is also in part a completion of sorts, and I hope an inspiration to others who feel that they're at the end of the road and ready for a new journey. Mucho amor. 
Additional notes and I began. Extreme auditory enhancement. I could hear the minutest of sounds over a very large range and perceive them all simultaneously. This lasted approximately 10 to 12 hours. Mild visual enhancement. Vivid colours, more colours, edge detection. A classic tryptamine induced visual perception of things lasting approximately 10 to 12 hours. Ataxia. I definitely had coordination issues. Walking took some effort and anything beyond what would have been difficult. This lasted approximately 36 hours. Insomnia. For the following two weeks, I slept little. A few hours at most in one stretch, but I felt good despite this, waking up feeling motivated and refreshed each time. Shout outs. To Noah, Chris and my pop. To all the others who've let me kick cold turkey in their apartments, houses, tree houses, basements and backyards. To all the girls and guys who still love me, even though I was a selfish junkie who was in love with his dope. And most importantly, but not always so obvious, thank you to the great mystery. For it is you, or us, that made this all possible. And I am eternally grateful. All the way to creation and back. An ayahuasca trip report by Aya. Posted to Earwood.org, October 11th, 2012. I'm extremely fortunate to be part of a very special family. My wife, her ex, and her daughter share the same raw passion as I for inward exploration. I've known my stepdaughter since she was a baby, and I've always felt deeply connected to her. Clairvoyants have repeatedly told me that I am her spiritual dad and many situations have validated this through life. We are a close unit, with absolute trust and loyalty between us all. We arrived at the Johannesburg venue for our second experience, and gave in to the gentle excitement around us. Most of the small group was familiar to us from the previous week's session. My first half mug of ayahuasca tasted as foul as it did the week before, only this time honey was not provided to ease the instantaneous urge to vomit. I nipped outside for a quick cigarette, and a friend joined me. Upon returning to the ceremony room, I lay back on my makeshift bed in anticipation. The psychedelic music-inspired images of bright coloured snake-like energy patterns were moving over me. The Australian shaman smudged us all using sage smoke with a feather. I felt a shift deep inside me as he cleared my chakras. I've heard many negative stories surrounding shamans who give ayahuasca ceremonies a religious flavour. My initial response to the suggestion that we should attend this ceremony was that I preferred doing light doses of farmawaska with my family in the comfort of our home. My friend Keith assured me that this shaman was different, and boy, was I glad that I listened to him. We took the tall Australian to dinner a few nights before the first session, to get a feel for everything, and not long after meeting him, our minds were made up. He gives preference and reverence to the plant, nothing else. He plays deep electronic music through the sessions with periods of silence between, he opens up a space for us to experience ayahuasca as a natural part of our own intelligence. He trusts that people have a cellular relationship to DMT and does not interfere with our innate ability to communicate on this level. In short, he was fabulous for our experience. I enjoyed the colourful graphic display as the underground music grew more intense. After what seemed like half an hour, he asked me if I wanted more ayahuasca. Even though I was doing fine in the space, my intention to go as deep as I could came through clearly, as I nodded excitedly. The second shot went down like acid, but managed to hold it down, but only just. My body went down, and I lost myself in a spectacular technicolour light show of magnanimous proportions. I remembered my intentions for doing the ceremony, and I began to speak to the presence. My veins bulged from what felt like a freezing liquid invading my bloodstream. I cried like a child, as I begged the mother to help my loved ones. The powerful waves of energy became so intense that I flitted in and out of minute states of unconsciousness, but managed to return to reality for long enough to complete the list of intentions that I had embedded in my memory for the days preceding. Now, it was time to explore. I enjoyed the warm feeling for a while, and then for some reason, I uttered the word, Kali, and the entire world I was in began to change into a dark and cloudy environment. 
freaked out by the sudden change of scene. I tried to will away the terrifying image of a dark, wrathful being threatening to break through the dark, cloudy veil. After a few minutes of begging and pleading, the scary visions finally began to fade away. I went into a dark void for a while. I had a few flashes of blurry images in this time, nothing I could hang on to or recognise. And then, I fell, backwards into a gigantic black hole. At first I tried to stop it, but my feeble efforts were futile. I let go in complete surrender, as a strange whooshing noise filled my consciousness. I sat up at this point, and noticed that one of the other participants was also sitting up. Our eyes locked for a few seconds, and a strange comfort swept through me. I knew that this stranger was a special being, and as I lay down again, I wept with joy, as I knew he understood me at that very moment. I was not alone. I had always programmed myself to believe that I was not from this realm, and that this was my first life experience as a human being on Earth, etc, etc. All previous attempts of far more asker, sidekicks, etc, to regress me into my past lives had failed miserably. Banisteriopsis capi blew through my blocked memory like nitroglycerin, and at some point, as I spiralled backwards into the endless void, I suddenly exploded with the force of an atom bomb. I felt minute fragments of my being merge with the cosmos, and an incredible feeling of interconnectedness swept over me. I witnessed an awe as deep spiritual realisations overwhelmed me. Most of them I can't remember, but the few that stuck in my memory are deeply profound. I wept as thousands of images began to rush through my being at lightning speed. At this point I felt the warm presence of that stranger standing behind me, giving me waves of loving energy and support. I basked in it, as I struggled to cope with the millennia of information that was swamping my very core. I felt him follow me to the very edge of my own reality, and all that time, knowing that it was encouraging me to go even further. I managed to hold on to one frame of an ancient lifetime as a warrior leader. I felt the blood of many on my hands, and I cringed as waves of guilt filtered through me. I had a glimpse of many dark images of lifetimes on Earth, but could not process them in time. However, the emotions from thousands of incarnations were made available to me in a massive download of pain, suffering, guilt, exhilaration, joy, sexuality, morbidity, anger, judgement, love lost, love gained, depression, anxiety, wholesomeness, fertility, etc, etc, etc. This was especially hard on me, and I blacked out a few times in this state. It was an overwhelming amount to deal with at one time. People around me in the ceremony room later told me that I was extremely loud and distressed at intervals. I guess this must have been one of them. By this time, I'd lost all recollections of who I was, where I was, or even what I was, and the fear began creeping over me as I contemplated the reality of being lost forever in this dark space. The stranger had disappeared, and I knew that I was very deep in this strange space. All the while, I still had the feeling of falling backwards in that crazy spiralling motion. I realised now that this was the reason we need God in our lives. When confronted by our true selves, it is difficult to cope with our sheer power. It is much easier to deal with life when another is responsible for everything. At last, everything slowed down and I felt an incredible oasis of peace and tranquility. It lasted a good while. Incredible waves of energy surged through my being, as I realised that this must be the place we hang in before manifesting into form. As time passed, I felt different emotions in that state of lonely and timeless perfection. There was incredible sadness, loneliness, longing, power, non-attachment, beauty, desperation, etc. I understood that this was the answer to my own question about why we're here. I always wondered why perfect beings would ever want to be born in the material reality, which is so full of challenges. Well, in that state of perfection, pregnant with potential and possibility, there is an overwhelming urge to express oneself as an individual. Even in that perfect balance, the need to be overpowers the absolute form of nothingness. We are all here to express ourselves in the way that we have chosen before birth. Whether it is a life of hardship or success, our higher selves are unconcerned with the material judgments of right and wrong, good or bad. Our higher selves are delighted to be part of this play. We just take it all too seriously and get caught up in the dualities. 
That was incredibly revealing for me. Then I remember being in a starlit void of some kind. There were bright sparks popping in and out of existence all around me. I realised I was in the place of creation and possibility. Waves of exhilaration permeated my being, but I also felt the crushing weight of responsibility at the same time. I knew that I could reach out and touch any spark I wanted, and that would bring something into existence. I also knew that I had no control of what the outcome would be, as good or bad did not feature in this state, so I declined the offer. I realised then that everything is perfect as it is. All we need to do is be grateful for what is. Everything is perfect. And when given an opportunity to change something for better or worse, I was satisfied with what I had. Again, very profound indeed. At some point afterwards, I was cast into a dark jungle scene. I remember being terrified as dark beings pursued me through the forest. I ran and ran for what seemed like hours. I could hear the heavy breathing behind me getting closer and closer all the time. At the same time, I had a strange awareness that I was running from myself. I suddenly felt a surge of needle-like pains in my feet. At this point, I was jolted back into my body and I sat up in an instant. A few seconds passed as I finally realised where I was and that the shaman was performing some sort of weird reflexology on my feet. The pain rose up through my body and I felt a strange loving sensation come over me. I knew I was safe in his care. I felt him reassuring me that everything was alright. I relaxed, let go, and entered a deeply peaceful state of surrender. That was the last memory I had. After the reflexology, I might have drifted peacefully for hours, but at some point, I did fall asleep. I awoke to noises of people moving around in the room. Again, I had no recollection of whom or where I was. I struggled to open my eyes. The first picture that I saw upon opening my eyes was my wife's beautiful face. That was just pure magic for me. I struggled to clear the blurry image, and at last, clarity emerged from the fog. We smiled at each other for a long time, and at last I had the power of movement. People were moving softly about the room. I wanted to get up and go outside for a cigarette, but was not confident that I could. It took me about ten minutes to get to my feet with the help of the wall of support. Thankfully, my wife's ex came over and helped out of the room. My legs felt like jelly, but he expertly guided me to the front yard, where participants were excitedly discussing their experience. I leaned against my car, as I struggled to process the conversations around me. My wife appeared deep in conversation, with the stranger who accompanied me in my trip. Our eyes met, and I knew that the special man understood everything. At that point, I couldn't remember much of my experience, but he jogged my memory sufficiently. He remembered more of my trip at that point than I did myself. An incredible connection manifested between the stranger and I, and as we spoke, I realised it was an experienced traveller with psychic gifts. I promised to call him in a few days to discuss my experience in a sober state, as I was still tripping in waves. The whole scene was of deep love and joy between all the people there. Just a very sensitive, loving and gentle space. Wow, what an experience that was. As we drove home hours later, we shared our experiences and chatted endlessly about it all. The space, the people we'd connected with, the kindness, the love, etc. Deep inside, we all had a notion that our lives had been touched forever. All we could feel right now was deep gratefulness for the opportunity to rewire our subconscious selves. Thank you Julian, thank you Ishmael, and family for providing the healing space. Thank you Amit for sharing my journey. Thank you to my family for allowing us all the space and love to grow. And thank you Mother Ayahuasca for revealing herself to me, my family and the rest of the group. And finally, thank you, spirits and guides of the jungle. Timeless Moments in the Universe A 2CB, LSD and MDA trip report by Raw Posted to Irwid.org May 27th, 2022 On Saturday the previous week My trip buddy Answers and I 
Raw, decide to gather the next weekend to take a 2CB psychedelic adventure. Little did we know, it would become one of the most magical adventures of our lives, one of the most important adventures a human can ever experience. This is the unlocking of the mind, reaching a new level of consciousness. On Friday of the planned weekend, I take the day off work to cool down and meditate on the impending trip. Only a light meal is consumed earlier in the day, after picking up answers from the light rail station. 5pm. After our light meal, we begin preparing set and setting. We set up videos to watch on the TV, as well as music. 6.30pm. We are still slightly affected by some earlier keyfoil dabs. We realise that this relaxed state we're in is the perfect mindset to begin our journey. So we each take 25mg of 2CB hydrobromic acid. We begin listening to and talking about music, a shared passion to pass the time. 7pm and the onset has happened for me, but not answers. Since I'm getting restless, we decide to head outside and watch the city below from our backyard. 7.20 Getting cold and shivery from the come up, so we head inside with the intention of grabbing clothes and the Keef oil dome plus nail setup, as well as a blanket so we can comfortably watch the sunset. 7.25 we get back inside, and this alone seems to kick us up both to a plus two on the Shulgin rating scale. 7.40 We head back outside of all the items and smoke more keyfoil while we watch the sunset and city as we slowly climb up to a full plus three. We're both feeling warm with an amazing body high now. 8.35 The contrast between our 2CB warm bodies and the night are becoming too much, and we head back inside. We begin listening to music again, and talk away the hours while also exploring my apartment. 9.45 Around this time, we are agreeing on how showers are a very serene experience while on a psychedelic. We go look at my shower to examine why this one in particular is so good. I commented that it's amazing how a psychedelic drug can reduce two grown men to standing in a shower with their clothes on, examining the surrounding environment. 11.50 Still talking, and on a plus three as well. We realise the peak is starting to fade, and our minds enter a state of clarity. I said something to answers, like, how could I feel any better than this? But he just sort of chuckled at me. Answers, being an experienced tripper, realised the mindset the 2CB had put us in was perfect to take our experience to the next level. We talked for a bit, and both agreed to take 300 to 350 micrograms of LSD, in the form of two blotters each. We both get lost in the music while we work the blotters under our tongue. 12.30am. Consciousness begins to fade. 12.45. Time stops and we begin to enter a new world. The LSD has hit its own plus three. We are both giggling on the couch while we are coming up. 1am. We break through to plateau. Beginning and end are happening at the same time. The gaps between thought as it rises and falls are an eternity or another open dimension for the mind to explore. I experienced my birth and my death, and saw the formation of thought itself within my own mind. This is a plus four experience. I have reached a state of nirvana now. Eckhart Tolle once wrote, the secret to life is to die before you die. Once you've found death before it has found you, you have become immortal. Time is simply another dimension that our lives are projected across. Answers, being the experienced tripper, knows exactly what to do now that we have reached this state of clarity, this thoughtless awareness. We go into my room, and before we close the door, we tell ourselves that by closing it, all time will stop, and we will be in this room forever. Every time we leave the room, will be a new adventure entirely. Beyond this, there is no accurate timeline until later in the experience. We're not sure on the exact order of these events in reality, in our world, this entire experience was happening without regard to the flow of time whatsoever. While in the separate timeless dimension within my bedroom, we listen to music, explore the depths of our own consciousness, and look at art. We spend time trying to describe our fantasies to one another. My dog has to go outside, so we go outside with him. Colours are very intense, and plants are full of life, and I'm connecting with my dog in ways I never imagined possible. The sun is rising, so we decide to take some chairs outside and watch the day come on. My dog is running around, playing while we enjoy the trees. We can hear the life in every single bird chirp, 
and feel the life in every living thing surrounding us. At some point, once the LSD effect started to come off peak, we decided to each take 50 milligrams of MDA. After coming up on this, the experience just turned to pure bliss. The mind was still unlocked, but now also more at peace with what is happening. Once peaking on the MDA, I decided to take a shower. It was the most serene shower I have ever taken. It felt like all the bad was washing away with it. I realise I have died, and I'm able to rebuild myself into the person I desire myself to be. I may come down off the drug, but I'll never come down from the experience it gave me. I decide to invite a good friend over who I know I need here during this divine transformation. He is someone I need around me while I'm rebuilding myself from the ground up. We begin to use glow sticks as a light source to stimulate the closed eye visuals, which becomes extremely intense. 11.50 AM. We are outside when my friend shows up, still on the plateau. We head inside and talk a bit before heading outside for our last outdoor adventure. 12.15 PM. We head outside again to grab the mail and enjoy nature for one last time. 3.15. We watch Finding Nemo, but I'm not really paying attention. I'm dwelling on what this new way of thinking means to me, and how I know I will never be the same person from this day forward. I have reached an internal peace, and have become immortal within my own realm of thought. I drift off to sleep at some point. 7pm. We wake up, and I am no longer in that space between thought. My other friend left while we were asleep. I have rejoined the flow of time. I drive answers back to the light rail station and invite some good friends over so I can share my experience with them. To this day, I have never come down off the trip. I am now able to meditate at any time and reach that point in time between thoughts. I have undergone the quintessential divine transformation in my own way. I have died before death came to me. Lying on a rocket beyond death, in the search for meaning. A 10 gram mushroom trip report, posted by Exploding Snowman to the Shroom subreddit. This report exists because I think that writing things down helps with integrating the experience, and getting some feedback could be interesting. The events that lead up to the trip, and the processing of the experience, are at least for me, essential to make sense of it. So this report could get a bit longer, and due to me being German, the grammar could get a bit weird sometimes but I'll try to keep it compact and readable. I've always been kind of a weirdo, maybe a bit on the spectrum. I never had many friends or much fun, and I was always very in my head, not very intuitive. The situation worsened significantly during my time at university. I wasn't able to socialize, everything sucked. Everyone sucked, I sucked. I tried to get my act together many times, started working out, eating right and all that, just to fall back down a few months later. After years of dragging myself through life without improvement, I thought that might have some sort of depression going on, and I knew that I needed to change on a deeper level. Having heard of the potential therapeutic effects of psilocybin on things like depression, I got a grow kit, and I grew some shrooms and started experimenting with them. I had no prior experience of psychedelics, and due to the lack of a social life, a trip sitter was not an option. Therefore, taking high doses was of course out of the question for my reasonable self. I tried microdosing, and it did help me to act like a human on the rare occasion that I came across and was pressured into interacting with homo sapiens. That was good, but it didn't fix me in the long term. So I took a gram and had a warm, mild trip. Some visuals and a tiny taste of the truth that should later be revealed to me. It had some lasting effects. I began being more open, and sometimes I even had some fun during interactions with other people. Despite that, I felt like it wasn't the time to trip for a few months afterwards, and only microdosed about once per week. Then, one day, I suddenly felt that it was time for a trip. It didn't feel like my own idea, but rather so as if the mushroom was inviting me towards it. I took two grams and had a trip that was compared to the first one. More intense, also colder and darker, but not bad or frightening. 
At one point into the experience, I kind of asked for a bad trip. I wanted to confront my shadow, but the immediate answer was that it wasn't the time for that, and that I had to heal first. From there on, the trip turned warmer. During this trip, I already knew that this was just the preparation for the real healing that would be coming tomorrow. Again, it didn't feel like my own decision. I just knew I had to go further the next day. So the following day, I took three grams of mushrooms. I always thought I should not take that much alone, but I knew that I didn't need a trip sitter. Somehow, I was 100% certain that the upcoming experience would be positive and healing. I completely trusted the mushroom to lead me to a good place. While I was beginning to feel a bit trippy, I had the realisation that the Lieber album from the band Heilung would be the ideal accommodation for the trip. I listened to that album a lot in the past, but never planned on listening to it while tripping, because I thought its dark and aggressive passages could trigger a bad trip. For this trip though, where I knew that a bad trip could not happen, this music seemed right. At the time when I started the music, I had another realisation. It had been already 45 minutes since I took the shrooms, and I knew I didn't take enough. Sure, I was already having slight optics and felt funny, and sure, the intensity was still rising, but I did think I had to take a bit more. So I took two more grams and laid down. Ten minutes later, I knew that adding two grams wasn't enough, so I did two more for the second time. I still didn't feel like making any decisions. I just knew I had to take more, and I knew I had to take more again, and added two grams for the third time. I was now beginning to feel very trippy. Everything was morphing and breathing and changing colours. All things were decorated with lines of small, complex forms. I was beginning to feel like I'm around my body and not just in it. I rolled out of the bed, crawled to the glass of mushrooms, and somehow managed to put one more gram on the scale. Sitting on the edge of my bed, I studied them intensely as they were dancing in my hand. One by one, I ate the mushrooms, and they tasted great. After that, I fell back and the rocket reached liftoff state. I felt utterly weightless, just flowing there as the shamanistic music was taking the shape of a sphere around me. I connected to a higher consciousness, and suddenly, just for a brief moment, the music sounded almost pathetic. The musicians seemed like children who were only imitating the real thing. But then, the music became extremely complex and mystic. I noticed that I was in a space, and the space was in me, and everything was in me. And I was in everything, and also was not. There was a tiny irrelevant dimension somewhere, in which lots of funny little creatures were running around, who were believing they had serious problems. One of those things used to be I. It was so funny how serious they took the game, how busy they were. Then there was a truth, so profound and meaningful, that there are no words to describe it. It kind of came back to me for a while to look at the truth from a human perspective. I looked at it, rather with my being than my eyes, although I couldn't really study it, because in the instance I was looking at it, I got completely overwhelmed by how good and simple it is. I had to laugh like crazy. Every time when I got down from a laughing fit, I tried to look at it again, causing a new laughing fit. It was like a ridiculous funny loop. I think I almost laughed myself to death. Speaking of death, when I came out of this loop, I felt like I was having a heart attack, a stroke, and as if my lungs were shutting down entirely. I was pretty sure I was dying at this point, but that was alright. I didn't mind. Suddenly, time stretched like a chewing gum. The frequency reached a higher and higher pitch as I flew through a tunnel into a particular part of the music. I zoomed in and in and in, like a fractal zoom, but not with form, but with time and sound. Although, time and sound took form as well. Honestly, time, sound and form were kind of the same thing at that point. I can barely remember what followed. I think I was just bathing in the pure, eternal bliss of it. Only consciousness dancing. After I don't know how long, I re-emerged in the human form as the surrounding music was putting me back together. I was made anew. I believe this out-of-body phase of the trip must have lasted for about two hours in Earth time. Somehow, I must have hit the button on my earplugs at some point, pausing and replaying the music, because when this phase of the trip was coming to an end, the music was coming to an end as well. After that, 
I was still having strong optics and felt very trippy, but I stayed in my body and had some understanding of the reality around me. I was slowly arriving in this dimension as I was lying there in constant intense happiness. I finally understood. The mystic hallucinogenic phase of the trip slowly faded out and was replaced by an unprecedented clarity and energy. I've never taken MDMA, but what followed felt like the effects of MDMA that are described. Even six hours after I took the shrooms, my pupils were huge and I walked around with unlimited energy. I felt like I saw everything for the first time, which was in a way true, because I was a new person. I felt so natural and happy. For the first time since I can remember, the judging, criticising, grumpy voice in my head was completely silent. After the trip, that launched me far out of this reality. I was more present than I had ever been, and reality felt more real than it ever did before. I'd never been so sober. Now, a few days later, I'm still positively different. Every time I look at a tree, or water, or clouds, I see these things like I've seen them as a child. Everything is clear and alive. Things that I used to perceive as huge problems just don't bother me anymore. I want to meet people and do peoply things. I have the feeling that a lot is going to change. Naturally, I was thinking intensely about the experience these days and tried to understand what happened. I wondered how a spiritual event of such magnitude was even possible, and whether I had to reconsider my agnosticism. Did I truly visit a metaphysical dimension that is more real than this one? Was my intense happiness the result of my experience? Or was my experience just a rationalisation of my subconsciousness to explain my euphoria that was caused by chemicals that flooded my brain? The realisations I had can't just have been meaningless nonsense. Objectively speaking, because instead of everyone's brain making up something else, other people who go on this journey seem to have similar realisations as mine. Subjectively, because I know that the truth I saw was self-evident. It was as logical as the statement that 2 plus 2 equals 4. I think either the spiritual metaphysical explanation is true, or the experience is a spiritual projection of a truth that could be materialistically explainable, and that lies hidden in everyone's subconsciousness and reveals itself to us in such a way that we can understand it best. So right now, I'm still agnostic, but I'm convinced that the realisations I had are in a way true, and that the experience was deeply meaningful and profound. I know, taking 10 gram of mushrooms unprepared without a trip sitter in a not so good life situation is generally not advised, and maybe it would go wrong in most cases. But for me, it didn't start a horror trip, it ended one. The Godhead, an Amanita Muscaria trip report by Joe Schmo, posted to Irwood.org January 16th, 2021. Dose, 14 grams of dried Amanita Muscaria caps. Weight, 130 pounds roughly. Method of ingestion, oral, simmered for 25 to 30 minutes and filtered through coffee filter into tea. Important notes before the trip. Some events may seem out of order, and this is because in this particular state of consciousness, or reality as I was experiencing it, the concept of time was non-existent. Instead, events happen at the same time, and are then shown in a particular order for the sake of my comprehension. 2. Some events or information may contradict. And 3. This is still a fresh experience. Happened about 3 nights ago as of writing this. Things still need to be processed fully. At around 4pm Friday evening, I received a package of what was labelled as Grade A Plus Amanita Muscaria Caps from Washington. 14 grams. I've been checking the USPS tracking, so I knew it would come that day, so I prepped myself beforehand. Fasting for 6 hours, meditation throughout the day to clear any negative thoughts, and a quick walk to clear my mind as well, knowing I'd be consuming this mushroom today. I opened the package and found 5 small to medium mushrooms, ranging from 1 inch to 1.5 inches. The colourings were almost a brownish yellow to a nice deep orange, with quite a few membrane spots. Near 5pm, 
I took all five small to medium, cracker dry caps, and put them into my mortar and pestle and began grinding them up. After about an hour or so, the amanitas were now a fine powder, with just very small bits and chunks in them. At ten past six, I set the powder in a small pot of water, simmering for thirty minutes and stirring frequently. T plus zero hours. At 6.45, I put an album on and take a sip between each song, as I want to drink the brew slowly. After 20 minutes, the tea is gone, and I lay down and close my eyes. T plus 45 minutes. At the moment, I'm not sure if it's just a placebo effect or not, but I feel my thought process is slightly different. Almost a bit more analytical, simply thinking deeper. T plus 2 hours and 40 minutes. I must have either fallen asleep or been lost in thought completely. A call from my neighbour wanting to hang out snapped me back into it. Not realising what state I was in currently, I said yes, and was later told that my words were slurred. I hung up the phone, and then stood up out of bed. I immediately noticed a loss of equilibrium, as well as the breathing wall effect, i.e. pulsating or breathing walls, objects, etc. Somewhat similar to alcohol intoxication, although without the nausea or discomfort. I laid back down and closed my eyes once again. T plus unknown. Before I know it, I am under the trance of an interesting hallucination. There is absolutely nothing but a single black dot in the middle of whiteness. I had no body, I was just consciousness. I look at this point, and something inside me just tells me not to go below it. Something else tells me to move. So I start moving away from this point for what felt like only a few minutes, and found what I believed to be the same dot or point. I was slightly confused. So I moved on once again, and, once again, I found the same point. It did not feel like I was going in a circle, or around a sphere. In fact, I somehow knew that this nothingness was infinite. I then kept saying to myself something along the lines of, oh, it just keeps going, or it never ends. These phrases resonated with me in some way. As of right now, I'm not sure why though. I'd also like to point out that I know that this was a hallucination, and not a dream due to the fact that at one point during this, I very, very slightly faded back into reality and saw my legs kicking in my bed. T plus unknown. After a little while of this infinite loop, I stopped at the little black dot and simply watched it. The black dot tilted away and towards me, 90 degrees so that it then became a line. The line then shrunk into another dot and the cycle repeated for a while until reversing. Eventually, it went from a two-dimensional circle and formed into a three-dimensional sphere. This happened many, many times, almost infinitely, in an instant until the spheres formed a molecule. It was then clear to me that what I was witnessing was a three-dimensional creation at its simplest form. At this point, these molecules formed infinitely, and I took a step back to see what they were forming. What I saw was a memory of me having a talk with a friend. We were having a philosophical discussion about religion, at one point during the conversation we had, I said, who knows, I could be God, you could be God. And this is where everything got incredibly intense. T plus unknown. As soon as the words, I could be God, came out of my mouth, I lost knowledge of language. I didn't know how to speak, though I did understand the concept of words. Suddenly the word, forgot, popped into my mind. That was the only word I knew. So I began thinking as hard as I can trying to figure out what it is I forgot. Slowly, I started remembering words, word by word. I remembered them in an order that would form a sentence. I slowly started forming the sentence. This is how it started, and other similar sentences along those lines, like, this is what happened at the beginning. And as I remember each word, it comes with a memory to remember as well. The memories are almost like the life of the universe, in reverse chronological order, until the last memory and word. The memory being some sort of god or creator looking at the universe and saying, I want to experience this. The last word being forget. I am now in a blank nothingness, in my own mind maybe. I ask myself a million questions in an instant. Hard questions like, what is life? Why is the universe? What is the point? and I gave the same exact answer for all of them. The thing is, my answer, as I conceived it at least, was beyond language. It has infinite meaning. The only thing that comes closest in linguistics 
though again nowhere near the answer I gave, is the phrase, whatever you want. It may seem simple, and it is, but at the same time, a person can write for a hundred years straight and not fully portray the two second answer. T plus unknown to T plus 13 hours and 15 minutes. I am in the same blank space, but looking in on the universe from the outside. I say I, because at this point it feels as if it isn't even me, and I'm seeing through the eyes of another entity. The layout of the universe is in the concept of the no motion theory, where it states that if you take a single point in time, there is no motion, meaning there is no motion at any point in time. With that being said, it was, essentially, a model of the universe depicting every single point in time that has occurred or will occur. This entity points to a specific area. This location in the universe and around this specific time. I then witness the birth of creation, again, and then every single point in time up to the point I wake up. I'm awake now, and the time is a little past 8am. T plus 13 hours and 15 minutes. As I awake, I shoot straight up out of bed in shock, wondering if I'd just experienced what I'd actually experienced. Physically, I feel very rejuvenated, but mentally I'm quite confused. I step out of bed, walk around, hold my arms out, and touch various things around my room to see if I'm still tripping. After I realise I'm back in my own reality, the confusion is replaced with positive awe and disbelief. TLDR version I ate some mushrooms, and I saw the universe being born. And I was also god or something. Conclusion It's been about a month after the trip, and what a trip that was. This is the first time I've experienced the godhead, and I gotta say, absolutely mind-blowing. I got a lot out of this experience, especially spiritually, and I'm usually not a spiritual or religious person. I didn't expect anything like this to happen, but not disappointed at all. As a matter of fact, I would try this sacred mushroom again. A true 10 out of 10 experience. A sliver of what God feels. An LSD trip report sent in by a subscriber. Experience date, May 2022. It was the second semester of my freshman year in college, when one of my friends and I decided to dip our feet into the world of psychedelics by ordering tabs of LSD online. We split the 10 tabs when they arrived, around 100 micrograms each, and excitedly discussed when it would be the best time to take one. I finally chose the following day, as I'd finished my finals and had nothing that would cause me any stress. My friend was not able to take them, as he still had assignments. Nevertheless, he offered to trip sit me. We were both inexperienced, but understood that it would be best that we had a person looking after us. He had no prior experience being the caretaker of a tripping person, but I knew him well enough and trusted him for the task. The next morning, I got up late and ate a light meal in the university dining hall. I returned to my dorm and delicately picked up one of the blotters, and noted the unicorn image imprinted on the front before placing it on my tongue. I washed it down with a swig of water, and messaged my friend letting him know that I had taken it. It was around noon, and I wandered into one of the rooms on my floor, where I knew my other dorm mates would be watching a movie. About 20 minutes passed of watching, and I started to feel hungry, even though I'd just eaten. I filled a bowl of Chex Mix, yet after putting just one into my mouth, I found that the flavour was just too strong for my taste buds. Immediately, my hunger dissipated, and I knew the tab was starting to take effect. I set the bowl to the side and felt a mild drowsiness start to take hold, as well as the slight feeling of time starting to slow down. After watching the movie for perhaps 10 minutes or so, my friend entered the room and advised that we go for a walk. He did not like the setting of the room, because it was dark and the movie had occasional scenes of scary imagery. I was mildly annoyed, because I saw nothing wrong and just wanted to sink into the couch I was sitting on, but looking back, I'm relieved about the change of location. Who knows how the trip would have turned out. I'd not done much research beforehand and didn't know just how much of an impact the set and setting have. I'm glad I chose to go with him. We set off from the fourth floor of the dorm with another friend, who brought along a baseball and catcher mitts. I was getting no visuals, but the sense of time becoming slower was growing, and the staircase from the fourth floor seemed to spiral on for a very long time. 
Behind our dorm was a large field of grass, where sports clubs sometimes went to hold the practices. The weather was also perfect and warm, with a cloudy but overall sunny day. Colours were just starting to become more vibrant now, but I was still able to toss around the baseball without much difficulty. Eventually, however, I became slightly less coordinated and realised that tossing the ball around may not be the best idea. I told my friends that I would just sit in the grass while they continued. Soon, I began to notice how their motions became more fluid and how an afterimage of their movement seemed to follow them. I became fascinated as the world began to brighten little by little and the bricks on the side of the dorm seemed to shift around. It was nothing intense, rather small subtle changes. We left the field after perhaps 20 minutes. It was hard to tell exactly how much time passed. On our way back to the dorm, I remember complimenting the sweater of the other friend who came with us, as its turquoise hue was particularly stunning to me. He laughed, as he was told by my original friend that I was tripping. We went back up the stairs, and this time, it took an eternity climbing them, even more so than before. I thought we would never reach the top. When we finally did, the friend that decided to tag along bade us farewell and left. My trip sitter asked me questions about what I was seeing, and suggested we go for a longer walk around outside. I agreed, and this time, we took the elevator on the opposite side of the building. The designs on the carpet floors were swirling around my feet like smoke, and we stepped out of the dorm again on a different path that would take us to another part of campus. We passed other buildings on our way, and I couldn't help but marvel and verbalise about every tree and flower that we passed. We didn't have a specific planned route, and found ourselves on a straight sidewalk lined with trees. Along the way, I would point to the flowers and describe their vibrancy to my friend. I also observed the buildings and their moving walls, and noticed that what was nature-made and what was man-made had their own distinct characteristics and movements. The bricks of the buildings flowed differently than the bark of the trees lining the sidewalk. The clear differentiations fascinated me. Both were beautiful in their own ways, but it was easy to see that the nature-made things were far superior in design. They were almost otherworldly in detail. I wanted nothing more than to just admire the beauty of the world, and I felt myself become extremely at ease. I slowed down, and my friend slowed down with me. This feeling of contentment grew, and I walked down the sidewalk at a leisurely pace. I was a visitor, walking through a museum to appreciate the art pieces. I had not a care in the world at this point, and I mean that in the deepest way possible. I had a permanent smile of contentment on my face, and I almost felt my eyes radiate love and peace as I turned towards my friend and said, I'm so at peace right now, that if you stabbed me, I'd probably be okay with it. He was taken aback, and in that moment, I truly was fine with every outcome that could ever happen to me. A nuke could have dropped from the sky at that moment, and I would have happily run to catch it. My friend was almost in awe at the nonsense I was spewing, and exclaimed, you seem to be doing really well. I should have taken it with you. I said that it was okay, and became acutely aware of how nervous and pent up he was. He had no experience of trip sitting, and did not know how to react and take care of me. I find it funny, how I was the one who ended up asking him how he was doing, and if he was alright, as his emotions became clear for me to read. The trip turned me more towards my thoughts, and I came to the epiphany that when someone is on LSD, the visuals and patterns are just side effects. The realisations about reality, yourself and God, are what really make the trip meaningful and worthwhile. I was already running down the thought rabbit holes when we returned to the fourth floor of our dorm, and was fully in thought when we reached our dorm floor lounge, which had windows overlooking the fields behind the building. At the time, it was just me and him, and I spent time doing my best to form my thoughts into words for him to understand. I felt that I understood every philosopher, and why they come to the concepts that they do. I also understood why the hippies preached peace and love. I pondered the universe and good versus evil. I felt that everything was connected, and in my mind's eye, could perceive lines of vibrant colours connecting every living thing in the world and the universe. In my mind, I followed the lines in hopes of finding their source, and traced back into mankind's history to find it. It all came to one centre, and in that centre was God. There was no other source. I could not find any other possible cause for the world, creation, and the universe. There was only one, and my mind almost orgasmed at the epiphany. In that moment, I felt a wave of tremendous love for everything, and I knew that this must be a sliver of what God feels for his handiwork that is earth and humanity. I tried to explain to my friend, but words fell short, 
and the only way for anyone to truly understand was to feel what I was feeling. I even told him, the words I'm saying right now mean nothing. These words can't explain it. Over time, more of my friends and dorm mates filled the fourth floor lounge, and I sat myself on a couch facing away from the windows, yet I could feel time passing into the day's golden hour. I was lost in thought, hardly paying attention to the speckled dots of glowing colours sprayed across the ceiling and the waving carpet. The feelings of love and contentment did not abate. With my friends laughing and talking, along with the streams of brilliant golden sunlight coming in through the window, I felt the trip peak. I was in sheer bliss, and I felt as if I was in heaven. I did not need to die to experience heaven. Heaven was a place in which there was complete contentment, overshadowed by love. I also pondered the evil that was in opposition to this heaven, but it paled in comparison to the love, and was more like a failing tendril of shadow snaking through creation, rather than the strong, vibrant lines connecting us all. I knew with firmness that all of the injustice and harm done to others would eventually be dealt with, just not now. Evil was more of an annoyance than anything, a failing, pitiful creature that was doomed in the end. I could have stayed there forever, but my friend suggested we eat dinner at the dining hall. At first I didn't want to go, but realised that in order to keep my physical vessel going, I needed sustenance. I made sure to drink some water before we left. At the dining hall, I observed the crowds of students and looked at them all with pure love. They were like me, and beautiful, yet they could just not see it. Their emotions were as plain as day, and I could see just how much they tried to hide their true feelings. My eyes swept across the faces with love as I waited in line. I looked at them as if they were my own children. I ate with my friend, and now that we were sitting face to face, I could really grasp how nervous he was. Filled with concern and love, I checked up on him. He seemed to be taken aback when I asked him. He was the one supposed to be looking after me, and not the other way around. He would then ask how my food tasted, and what I saw while I was dripping. I told him that the food was good, but inwardly, I knew he would not understand that the physical aspects of the trip were not important to me anymore. We parted ways when we returned from eating, and I felt an overwhelming urge to go outside and experience the evening. I needed the fresh air, and the air of the building was almost suffocating. After searching for a spot, I chose a park bench below a small, low-hanging tree, and basked in the contentment I felt. The evening had cooled, and the sky was a dark blue. It was perfect for the come down of the trip. I stared up at the sky through the leaves of the tree, and watched the leaves melt together and swirl in fractal patterns. I felt the wind on my skin. It may have been chilling to my sober self, but I loved every second of it in that moment, because I knew I was alive. I received the message, a 5MEO DMT trip report by 5NEO, posted to Earwood.org October 31st, 2017. Dosage, 40mg. Earwood note, the dose described in this report is very high and potentially beyond Earwood's heavy range and could pose serious health risks or result in unwanted extreme effects. Sometimes, extremely high doses reported are errors rather than actual doses used. So before I even begin to attempt this, Allow me to make a few disclaimers. 1. I didn't want to write this. The idea of trying to put into words the experiences I've had with this substance is so absurd that you could only understand how absurd it is if you've been there. I know that's cliche, and a lot of what I'm going to say will be, and hard to believe also. I'm opening myself up to criticism here, and it's absolutely true and I don't need to embellish. I couldn't have made this up. 2. The doses of which I'll be reporting on, I've since come out to find, are far too much, possibly unsafe, and I do not recommend anyone trying it. However, that reason alone is why I am writing about them. And three, when I took this medicine, I respected it. I set clear intentions and meditated before taking it. That is important and will influence the experience I have. Now, let's begin the fun part. I was in Mexico at a little gated community, where some shamanic medicine men practiced that I met through what I thought at the time was mere luck. They told me about this modern to ancient medicine from the Sonoran Desert Toads, and that I could meet God. I was sceptical, 
I wasn't an atheist, but was definitely agnostic. However, as so, the idea of meeting this big guy in the sky piqued my interest, so I agreed to give it a go. We were in a beachfront mansion, and they left me on the upper floor while the shaman went to prepare the space and the medicine. Sometime later, she emerged requesting me to follow. I obliged and entered what had become a sacred space. She instructed me to set clear intentions and meditate before we began. As she wafted sage around me in the space we occupied for the moment, I spoke to the medicine. I will respect you and allow you to do with me what needs to be done. I need to reconnect with the grand creator and my own creativity. And then, I meditated. I was nervous, but I'd never heard of this type of DMT before, and didn't really anticipate or believe what was about to happen was even possible. Just to add a little context to what I said here, for those that don't know, uh, 5-MeO DMT, despite being somewhat comparable in effects to DMT, is actually substantially more potent and shouldn't be confused with regular NN DMT, despite both of them being psychedelic tryptamines. Okay, she said, and I opened my eyes to see the pipe was ready to go and about 5 inches from my face. There was no turning back now, and the next motions I made almost felt robotic, like I wasn't even choosing to do it. I was scared, but somehow something was moving me to the pipe. She lit a torch and held it to the pipe, and I could hear a crackle and she put it to my lips. Breathe slowly, she said, like sucking through a straw. I thought I'd gotten it all, and then, get the last little bit, she said. And so I did. I sucked one last time with all I had, filling my lungs as far as I could. I held it as she counted to ten. By this point, ten seconds in, she had to remind me to exhale. When I did, I saw fractals in the smoke, and a golden yellow haze began to fill my vision from the outside in. This happens every time I vaporise 40 milligrams. I then laid back with my head on the pillow, and instantly, blasted off. What the shaman watched was me lie motionless with my eyes closed and a smile from ear to ear for 20 minutes. What I saw was a tunnel of light and colour that whirled around me as I blasted into the great void. Within moments, the veil was lifted, and I'd popped into the anti-gravital void and was staring at a light brighter than bright. It was white if I had to put it in terms people understand, but there were other colours involved, and they were in motion. It was sort of like looking at oil on a pavement. There's a colour, but it's more than one. It's tough to describe. It's actually describing the quality of being iridescent, if you didn't know. There are colours in this that most people haven't even seen, and until you do, that seems impossible, I know. By this point, any shred of who I was had dissolved. I didn't have a name, a body, a mind, nothing. And to my knowledge, I never had. It was freeing in some sense, but I felt a desire to enter this light. Before I could, something had to destroy what was left of me. I had to die. I accepted that, and something struck me, as if I were a window pane and a bolt of electricity flicked me, and I shattered into a trillion of the most intricate fractals I've ever seen. And then, I entered it. It was love, foremost. But also forgiveness, compassion, joy. Youthful, but also ancient. It was comforting and familiar. It was ecstasy. It was nirvana. In this place, there was no separation. It was complete unity with everything, and had always been that way. This was God. And I had received that message. Not through language or telepathy but just inherently receiving the message that this was God and that this is where souls come from and return to. I also had a vision of Africa. I believe there were other visions, but I can't recall them now. I just never wanted to leave this space. And then, before I knew it, bam, I was back in the prison of my body. But now, I had the message. This world we live in is false, a construct of our own creation. And I had learnt that God is in us, and we are in God, all the time. I am you, and you are me, and we always have been. We are the stardust and water, the mountains and the beaches. And what we see in front of our eyes is no more real than the dreams we have at night. I'm no longer afraid to die now. Death is the beginning of the real adventure.
7 grams alone in a cabin. A mushroom trip report sent in by a subscriber. I'm pretty experienced in psychedelics, having over a decade of trip experience. I had other heavy trips before, including a 7 gram mushroom trip, which was my second ever experience, and dropping 20 tabs of acid in one sitting, both in silent darkness. My 7 gram trip was during my senior year of high school on a Thursday. I don't remember the exact date, but it was during spring. While having those trips did prepare me for some of the craziest stuff, nothing could have prepared me for the suffering I felt with this one. This trip was the most intense experience to date. Listening to Terence McKenna was what initially got me into psychedelics, and I do like his high dose, infrequent trips approach. After my 7 gram trip, it was always a life goal of mine to do another high dose mushroom trip, but completely alone in a cabin in the woods. Some years after the initial 7 gram trip, I would trip pretty consistently, at least once a month for about two years, but on lower doses. I use it as a crutch because every time I had to make a major life decision, I would rely on the knowledge I would get from the trips. In one of my later experiences, the mushrooms told me I won't be given access back to that realm until I get my life in order by myself. There were a couple of requirements I would need to have passed, and until I did, I wouldn't be able to go back. I even tried taking mushrooms a couple times after that, and while I did feel the effects of the drug, the warm magic of the mushrooms was nowhere to be found. So it's been five years since my last trip, and over ten years since my seven gram trip, and I was content waiting with no rush or desire to go back there. However, there was a problem. Ultimately, I knew that regardless of what path I took in life, all paths would end up in the same place, and that place was taking seven grams of mushrooms alone in a cabin in the woods during silent darkness. To those that have taken mushrooms before, you know that it calls to you. Something just draws your soul towards it. To those that haven't, the best way I could describe it is it just starts as a simple thought out of the blue. Well, it's been a while since I've done mushrooms, now might be the perfect time. Then that thought goes away for a while, until it comes back a little bit stronger. Then, both the frequency and the intensity of that thought increases until it's resonating in your brain, an echo that can only be let out once you've had your trip. For many years, I didn't get the calling and wasn't even planning it, but I felt as if I was just summoned. The calling. As I mentioned, I knew at one point of my future that I would need to do this cabin in the woods trip. It was just something engraved in me. But the thing about taking a high dose psychedelic trip is that it can be absolutely terrifying. I've had some pretty dangerous, near death experiences in my life, but nothing compared to the absolute dread and terror I felt in my first seven gram trip. Thinking about it used to send shivers across my entire body, but I knew I had to go back. That future trip was haunting me for 10 years and I would think to myself, is this year the year? Then one day, December 13th, I was just talking to one of my friends about psychedelics, and I got the calling. This time, it didn't come as a thought, but it felt like I was being summoned. I wanted to take time off work and go away the next day, that's how bad the urge was. I just knew it was time. I booked the cabin for Christmas weekend and started preparing. When I first realised I had to go back, I was absolutely terrified. Suddenly I began getting flashbacks from the first trip things that I repressed. Every day I thought about it. I became more and more terrified, but then something within me switched during the last couple of days, and I was no longer afraid. I accepted my faith, and it felt like I was just in autopilot. I was no longer scared, and I just knew that on Friday night, I would be consuming the mushrooms, as if it's something that's already been written into my future. When that time came, I would be there, and it's something that was outside of my control. The journey. After booking the cabin and gathering the mushrooms, I found out that we were getting hit with one of the worst storms we were ever having in two decades. The United States had a very horrible storm the day before Christmas. It also happened to be a new moon that night. When I found out, I thought to myself, perfect, the set is being staged. Worst storm in decades during a new moon on one of the holiest days of the year in a cabin in the woods. Surely the set is staged for magic to happen that night. I wanted the journey to be intense. I felt like I was a knight on my horse going to face the dragon. Friday comes around and I have everything gathered as I'm ready to begin my journey. I finish work at 5 and start heading there around 6. Then I started driving there. It got dark quick and very cold. When I started the trip it was 30 degrees Fahrenheit. By the time I got there it was 8. The wind was so intense that going above 60 miles per hour would start shaking the car. But I was not afraid no longer. I was calm. I was the knight on the horse going to the lair of the dragon. 
The closer I got, the calmer I became. All the fear that I had was being evaporated. I knew that I was going to embrace my destiny. The trip. Once I get to the cabin, I smoke weed and just think about my life and my friends, my family, all the good moments in life. I begin crushing the mushrooms by hand and apologise to every single one of them. I'm sorry, I love you, you know. I realise that the dragon in the analogy is not the mushroom trip, as that's not what I needed to fight. The dragon is the fear of the mushroom trip. Then, I soak it in lemonade with freshly squeezed lemons. After crushing the mushrooms by hand, I begin rolling up my weed for the trip. I end up drinking the potion at midnight after the mushrooms have soaked for about 30 minutes. Put my phone on aeroplane mode to not be disturbed. After I gulp it down, I think to myself, is that it? Is this what I've been afraid of for 10 years? Within five minutes of consumption, I get an immense feeling of self-love. It was a very powerful feeling, almost over-exaggerated. It felt like my soul was the perfect match for my body or identity, and that I was very happy to be there. Then, I sit down on a couch and wait for the effects. I try and wait until I start feeling something before smoking, to smooth out the come-up. I knew I took a big dose, and people report effects already within the first 20 minutes. I keep waiting, but nothing crazy starts happening. So, I wait until 12.25 and I go out to smoke a blunt. I come back in and suddenly get very lethargic. At this time it's around 12.40 and I think to myself, now might be a good time to go lie down and close your eyes. So I head to the room I'm going to be tripping in and it's very dark in there, no music. It's begun. It starts off with a beautiful show, with all the complex psychedelic patterns you see in the Alex Gray paintings. So far the come up is going beautifully. The mushrooms told me that love is the answer. People like to go into high dose mushroom trips with a question or a certain purpose. What I found personally is that the question gets answered in the first couple minutes and the rest of the trip is just about survival. Then I start feeling what can be described as invisible mushroom fairies. I couldn't really see them, but there were millions of them. They were very small and what I imagine is circular shape. As soon as the fairies see me, they start celebrating and in a high pitched voice saying, Yay, M's back, welcome back. It felt like they were very happy to see me, and I was happy to see them. I was laying down with my eyes closed and opened my arms as if I was going for a hug. All the mushroom fairies went in for the hug, and I kept telling them that I loved them. It felt like seeing an old friend after a long time. Then, they took my hand and started to lead me through the mushroom dimension. The geometric psychedelic patterns had begun to turn into a video game-like place. I saw the robot boxing game where the red figure knocks out the blue one and that image got duplicated infinite number of times. At the end of each game, the fairies were cheering in a high-pitched voice. They carried me through their land and showed me different games like that. Each area was a moment of a game that got repeated infinite times, and when that moment came, all the fairies cheered. There were separate games I went to, but the boxing one is the only one I remember clearly. It did feel like I was in a circus inside a video game, not sure if this is due to my heavy gamer background or the realm is starting to transform to reflect a more modern time. I also heard the Mario noise sound going infinitely, like at a very fast, consistent pace. So far, the come up has been pleasant and the trip has been beautiful so far. Then, I get the urge to check the time, to measure how far into the trip I am just to see how well I'm doing. I'm wearing an analogue watch that doesn't light up and look at it. Absolute darkness, so I can't tell the time. I then try to stand up and walk to the light to see the time, but realise I barely have any balance. Then, I start crawling into the hallway to try and catch some light. I look at my watch. 1.15. Hmm, <laughs> not bad, I think to myself. So far I'm doing pretty good. So then, I crawl back into bed and close my eyes. This time when I go back, the fairies went away and I started seeing entities. I notice every time I close my eyes to dive back in, I begin to see dark entities which try to scare me. But I said out loud, you can't scare me, I love you. And then I was able to rise up to a higher place. This kept happening for a while, and then I started seeing this dark seductress. She was absolutely massive. It's hard to properly scale the mushroom dimension, but imagine looking up and just seeing this massive creature taking up the whole sky. She was dressed all in black, with long flowing black hair as well. She also had a black witch hat which was covering her eyes. I knew she was looking at me, even though her eyes were covered because her head was tilted towards my direction. I kept resisting her presence because something inherently told me that she was evil and I should keep resisting her. I was still feeling pretty good at that point and I got the urge to record the trip for future psychedelic explorers. 
feeling as if I've made a major discovery that I need to bring back to this earth. I thought to myself, I need to capture all this while I still remember it. This was at the 1 hour 40 minute mark, or 1.40am. It was very difficult to talk normally. It was very difficult to talk normally. I would start talking about the trip, and then have thought pattern loops which would distract me. The first thing mentioned in the recording was the humming noise. The Mario coin sound from the beginning of my trip began speeding up and becoming more uniform, almost as if it turned into a frequency, very similar to a humming sound. In the recording, I addressed it as the fucking humming of the universe. Around this time, is when I started feeling horrible. I became very nauseous and the trip was getting more intense by the minute and I was just barely holding on. I kept saying, I'm resisting, I'm resisting. I felt like I was losing my mind. I said to myself, oh, I feel like I'm losing my mind and oh, it's fucking marvellous. And then started dancing and singing for a couple of minutes. At this point, the only thing I could do is to keep focusing on my breath. I felt like I was barely keeping track of reality and I said, I guess this is it then. A new reality was about to break. That is when I decided to fall back into the trip and went to lie back down. This is when the real trip began. Next time I went back, the dark seductress went away. I saw death for a brief moment. It was like a dark cloud, an independent entity wrapped up in its own darkness. I thought to myself, is that the purpose of this trip? To face the fear of death? The death entity was moving slowly across my vision and then just stopped in front of me. It took a moment to look at me, inspect me, and then decided to wander off. When it turned away from me, it slowly started moving away, and I felt like I got transported somewhere else. Maybe it'll come back later to deal with me further in the trip, I thought to myself, it didn't. The next thing I saw was a Baphomet-looking entity coming at me with the fingers up, fingers down pose. I knew I was going to some dark places now. From here on, it just kept getting darker and darker for the next two hours. It's hard to keep track of the order of things. After making the recording, I drank some water and went to lie back down in the darkness, but the recording was still going. Things started getting more intense, and I became very uncomfortable. Every minute felt like eternity, and I was barely holding on to reality. At this point, I've already begun to let go of my identity, of my past, my future, myself. Nothing else mattered, except that current moment. I was there in the cabin at night, completely alone, and nobody was coming to help. I didn't even want the help, to be honest. I knew that the suffering I was going through at that moment was meant to be. There was no escape from this uncomfortable feeling. No kind words would have helped at all, nor the best medical treatment in the world. I tried to just lie down in the bed and breathe, but the mushroom energy was too strong. The closed eye visuals were no longer something I saw, but something that was moving through my consciousness. I tried to rise myself from a dark place by using the om noise, but it didn't help. The mushrooms were too strong. The energy in the bed was too intense. It just kept ripping through me, erasing parts of myself. So I got out trying to change the course of the trip. I could barely even walk and started crawling around the room. I tried to do anything I could to distract myself from the immense suffering I was feeling. I was just laying on the floor with my eyes closed, begging God for mercy, trying to remember even the most basic prayers. No matter what I did though, there was just no escape. It was an unbearable feeling of reality being torn apart. Around here, is when my identity was really losing its meaning. Even though I was able to remain conscious, nothing else was real. Other people weren't real, other time frames weren't real. The only real thing was that room and my insanity. I was on the floor just trying to continue breathing. I was twisting and jerking around, lying on the floor begging for mercy, doing different poses. Being in the child pose really helped a lot. It seemed the perfect pose to assume while going through the suffering and was just something that I went to naturally. I was lying on the floor for about 30 minutes, just mumbling incoherently. Then 46 minutes into the recording, or at 2.26am, I began talking again. So, what I learned about life in this trip? You gotta show up every day, and that's what matters. Everyday actions determine what happens to people. Willpower plus daily activity equals the life you want. And this is when it started happening. My separation from this world. I had this feeling come across me like we're all actors and this world isn't real. This whole world is a lie, just a temporary plane for us to live in. That is when I felt the pain of all the animals that froze to death that night. I felt their suffering. Even though I was going through this immense suffering, I was still blessed to be alive. Every moment of each life is precious and full of meaning. Then, my mind shifted to Anthony Bourdain and how he committed suicide. That's when I thought to myself, even suicide wouldn't save me from this. This existence is immortal. Even if I am no longer attached to this body, 
My existence will continue. There was really nothing I could do to escape this moment. This is when I realised how alone I actually was. In the middle of nowhere, going through one of the hardest times of my life. However, I was happy that nobody else was coming. As Terence always said, Go with it alone. I'm glad I didn't have a trip sitter, because if they saw what I was going through, they might have called for help and ended the trip prematurely. Even if there were 100 people there, not a single person would be able to help me right now. What I was going through was meant for me to go through, and just for me. The nausea kept growing worse until I just started throwing up at 2.38. I felt much better after I threw up, it became much easier to breathe. There wasn't any fear around it or hesitation like there is normally. I just puked and let it all out. After that, it became a little bit more manageable, but I still had to focus on my breath to stop reality from fully ripping apart. Most of my identity was already chipped away, and my past was irrelevant, and I couldn't even remember a single moment from my life. Who my friends or family were didn't matter, as I couldn't remember them at all. Even the world didn't seem real. We were just a bunch of actors for the greatest show. I was in that room, holding on to the edge of reality. After resisting for quite a while, I reached an epiphany. My insanity was the last thing holding reality together. That was the secret to the mushroom trip. You need to ascend through your insanity. I felt immense joy when I realised this, because for the first time during the trip, there was a way out. A possible relief. I already let go of everything else, and for my insanity to end, I needed to let go of reality entirely. It might seem like insanity would be easy, but it was the hardest thing to let go of, because it was the only thing keeping me in this world. My ego would rather suffer insanity than to cease existing. I struggled with this realisation for a couple of minutes before I made my final decision. I already let go of everything else, and this was the final step before I could be free from the suffering of my existence. I didn't know if I was going to come back, or where I would be going to, but I no longer cared. I just couldn't stay where I was. So, with my decision made, I went back to the bed, into the silent darkness, and said out loud, Goodbye world, I'll be back in a couple hours. I didn't go to another realm like I thought, but instead, I lived moments of other people's lives. One of my reincarnations was a moment in this overweight Latino boy's life, around 10-12 to 12 years old, and he just won a football game. Then, I shifted to a battlefield, thinking about the wars going on in the world. I was then a person who was just shot to death in the war, an innocent bystander just getting mowed down. I remember it felt like there were four or five bullets being shot through me. Then, for one of my forms, I was born as a deformed baby just going into this world. That one didn't last very long. I remember having a very deformed skull and crying, and then I left that form onto the other one. After that, I was a dog being beaten by its owner. The last form I remember clearly was a black slave during colonial American times getting whipped on my back. At this part of the trip, I just felt the suffering of different beings. Whilst it was very unpleasant, I was no longer me, no longer insane. Just a consciousness, existing free of identity. While that was happening in my head, in the real world I kept making a swimming motion with my arm, and I physically changed my location within the mushroom realm. It felt like my head was getting squeezed, as if I was going through the womb into this world. I was in the place where people get reborn, like the womb of the universe. My head was getting squeezed as I was being reborn, and then I popped out. And then, came the moment where my soul was fully free from my body. I remember I kept seeing the coat and shoes on a hanger, like when someone takes them off when they enter the house. My soul was just bare, alone in the realm without me. I was just me. Not the me in this world with my body, but the immortal me that's existed before this world and will exist after it. I'm pretty sure I was in the spirit realm at this point, completely unbound. I even might have seen God, the ultimate God, but I don't remember much of this part. It was just a very bright, warm feeling, and it had a very ultimate sense to it. The light was so bright, I couldn't even see the full figure. I gained conscious again when I opened my eyes, and I went straight for my phone to check the time. I reached down, turn over the phone, and see the time. 6.22am. I think to myself. <sighs> I survived. Update and closing thoughts. It's been two weeks since the trip, and I needed to get this out to process it. I didn't feel like my life really changes too much since the trip. It does feel like something shifted inside of me, but at the same time, I feel exactly the same. I think I'm past the stage where psychedelic trips will just give me an automatic power boost. For me to get the full effects of this trip, I would need to unpack and incorporate it while sober. Writing out this trip report was the first step of unpacking. 
One thing that I did notice is I don't really think of my life before this trip. I know I had one and I have the memories, but it doesn't really matter anymore. It's like the last chapter finished and a new chapter began free of the burdens of the past, free to plan out a future where I can decide what way to go. This trip mainly humbled me by showing the suffering of others around me. The two things I took away from this trip is the suffering of others and the feeling that this world is fake and we are just actors. During the end of the trip, it was a feeling I knew to be true, but now it's just a faint memory. As of now, I don't have any trips coming up, but I'm not opposed to the idea of going back. The fear that haunted me for 10 years is now gone. I'm no longer scared of that realm. While this trip was the most suffering I ever felt, I'm not bitter about it, but actually grateful. I've never been so happy to just be me in my own life, a feeling that many of us take for granted. Safe travels, everyone. ready. A 5 Emil DMT trip report, posted to earwid.org by DJ for funsies on November 30th, 2011. I feel it should be stated that I mine a 10 milligrams a day of sertraline hydrochloride, a common SSRI. However, I don't feel that it affected my experience at all. This would be the most comprehensive and detailed recollection my brain can produce to me. Friends have asked how I could remember so much when they couldn't, and to be honest, I couldn't answer them. I, personally, feel it is because of my natural photographic memory and obsessiveness and preparedness that I was prepared to take it all in. This is my first ever written report for any of my drug experiences. I'm feeling compelled to write it after the experience I recently, last night, had with 5 Amio DMT. As does everyone who does DMT, I consider myself an experienced tripper with many LSD, psilocybin, Amanita, Salvia, DXM, MDMA, MDA, and many combinations of all of them together. This experience, however, was a greater experience than any feeling I had ever had come over me during the highest peak or sharpest part of any trip before, or even greater than any body load I have ever felt from amphetamines. I recently grew incredibly curious about DMT, and especially 5-MeO-DMT, as it seemed to have a far greater enlightening effect to it. This was exactly what I've always been looking for in a psychedelic drug. I've always wanted to take something from a trip, or have learned something new during the experience and have yet to truly have it happen. Over three days, I read damn near every single one of the DMT and 5 of vault reports here at Earwid, and was enthralled by what the drug seemed to do. Enlighten. It was after I read a specific report that I decided this would be the last psychedelic I will use, and even now, the next day, I still feel the same. As soon as I knew of a very close friend who had some, I immediately met up with him and explained to him my feelings. Being as good of a friend as he is, he gladly obliged me and we left the party we were at and proceeded to his apartment. Once there, we turned off all the lights but his one tri light. It had a green, yellow and red light on it and put on his stereo at a mildly audible level. I put a Tempiopedic mattress topper up against the wall and sat down upon it and picked Radiohead's Nude as my trip song. It proved useless though, as I'll explain. The DMT my friend had procured was a very light, fluffy white powder, a crystalline material that immediately disappeared as soon as it touched skin and tingled wherever it touched. It was inside of the quick dissolved gel caps and was sticking to the plastic. He told me that each one was supposed to be one dose and each one was 10 US dollars, so I assumed it to be 10 milligrams. We put just barely enough cannabis in the bottom of his glass hand bowl to form a cover over the hole. We gingerly took off the top of the gel cap, which proved difficult as it disturbed the shards at the bottom greatly. We then dumped it right into the bowl and it poured to cover the whole thing. I laid back on the mattress and pressed play and held the bowl to my lips. I held the lighter over it so it all melted down into a blackish, may have just looked black due to the lack of light and or shadow, goop over it. I then lit almost the entire bowl in one hit and pulled as hard as I could, trying immensely to avoid pulling my adventure onto my teeth. 
I immediately tasted the metallic and unnatural. It was very hard to hold in, as I'd lit some resin and it was hurting my lungs. As soon as the smoke hit my lungs, the brick wall I was facing immediately started rippling, as if it was the surface of a body of water. It was rippling all along with Tom York of Radiohead's voice, as he hummed it was changing how fast the ripples went. I exhaled the first hit, and I saw the smoke flow right out of my mouth and straight out to the brick wall in front of me, and into a black hole in the wall I hadn't noticed before. In the brief second between my hits, which felt like a whole experience in itself, I closed my eyes and felt every feeling I had inside of my brain that I had ever felt come into me. It would start in my big toe and little toe on each foot, and then I felt each feeling spread into each of my toes individually, and they immediately flew up into my body. At first I was able to keep up and identify them and enjoy them separately, but suddenly they sped up and I was unable to interpret it, and I just felt as though my body was full of every feeling I could think of. I even started to feel some of my negative aspects coming in, such as anxiety and panic, but once I did, I smiled, and they were immediately flushed away with happiness. I opened my eyes, and my friend held the bolt in my mouth for me to hit it a second time, but I was barely able to. I fell forward when I tried, and he helped me make sure to get the hit. As I was holding in the smoke, I was watching the whole room start to spin clockwise around the hole my hit blew into. I was watching the light flow from the different light bulbs, and each stream went and expanded incredibly fast, but I was able to see all of them at all times. They were bouncing off of the walls and into and out of each other, making different colours pulse in front of me. I'd forgotten about the hit in my lungs. I breathed it out and watched as the smoke pulled the entire room into the black hole in the wall. The lamp got pulled into the hole before the flowing light did. After the lamp got sucked in, the walls were gone and the radio was still circling. I could see Tom York's voice as a colour in the vortex and it got sucked in moments before the radio did. I got very confused when all that was left in the room was the colour because it was moving fast enough to avoid the hole. However, I don't know whether I closed my eyes or the hole got powerful enough to suck in the light, but suddenly, I was just watching patterns flow in front of me. They were all very intricate, and every time I began to understand what one was, it would change, causing me a lot of frustration. I felt cheated. They were just layers of the patterns from the top of my vision to the bottom, each layer different and constantly changing, and I felt incredibly overwhelmed and minuscule, and was longing to be able to be a part of it and understand them fully. It was what I had been wanting all along. At that point, either I actually opened my physical eyes, or my consciousness opened its eyes. But what happened next, I was seeing with truly open eyes, whether they be spiritual or physical. Also, as this gets described, it all sounds very slow moving, but I assure you, it felt as though it was all happening incredibly quickly, and my brain was struggling to keep up with all of these sensations and sights and in retrospect, can be examined much deeper than during the experience. I opened my eyes to see triangles flying around an almost completely dome room. It was what being inside of a perfectly rounded igloo is like. When I opened my eyes, I saw the last triangle go into place. However, these were not regular triangles. Among their three equilateral sides, they had a sort of extra dimension to them. Not just a dimension as in depth, but as if they were in more than one dimension at the same time. They were all constantly shifting, and what colour they were was shifting as well, but there was never a hole. I was wondering in complete awe how they were able to do it. As I was beginning to explore the room I was in and develop questions, I began to hear a voice. This wasn't just any voice, however. It was my girlfriend's. It was my girlfriend of four years. I have no question will be my wife for the rest of my life. The minute I heard her voice, the feeling in my toes came back as I was looking around. This time it was an extreme amount of love flowing through me, and I wanted to cry but couldn't at the time. She said a single word to me, smile, in a very sweet voice, and so I did immediately. While smiling, 
I noticed that every triangle I smiled at turned a darker green. I don't know, and couldn't figure out then what it was doing to the triangle, but it turned a darker green and became much more single dimensional, as if I was merely in a room now. I felt better and better as I did this, so I continued through all of them, and soon the whole place was a dark green room that I felt very much a part of, and could suddenly sense something or some people outside of it. It wasn't like I could see silhouettes or anything, I merely was feeling these intense presences outside of the room that were all impressing themselves upon me independently, and at the same time. I couldn't see them or hear them in any way, but I could feel the immense amount of energy on the other side of the room, as if I was in an egg waiting to open. I could feel my girlfriend's presence again, and discern that hers was one of the presences outside. I felt a great yearning grow in me to get out there, and I felt a shift in the energy outside of the room. It was as if they felt or took notice of my desire and love, and turned their attention to me. I felt the presences examining me both inside and out. My gaze drifted to my chest and I could feel their presence like spotlights on me and inside of my brain. They were looking through the information inside my brain, as if checking for something or checking the preparedness. As they would examine an experience, I would feel it as well, as if they were replaying it inside of me. Several of the things they looked through involved my girlfriend and I and drug experiences we had together such as our LSD, mushrooms, MDMA, and just sober adventures we had together as well. They seemed to be measuring how much I loved her in all of these situations, and in different meaningful moments we had together. Then, I felt a wave of relief flow over my body, as if they were lessening their gaze into me. Immediately after this, I felt the strongest impression in my girlfriend's presence again. Her energy and consciousness were just on the outside of the room, I could feel it, and she was with the others as well. They seemed more and more familiar, as suddenly the experience began to slow down immensely. I felt as though I had been there for hours, and suddenly my girlfriend's voice made its last appearance, with her taunting and awe-inspiring. You're almost ready. However, it was a very soft yaw, and the almost had such an angst, and imagine the feeling right before you sneeze, but then don't. The word had that feeling behind it, causing my body to feel the magnitude of how close I was to being ready to meet them and be with them again, and followed by a very confident sounding ready. At this point in time, my experience was completely slowed down. I was just wondering what I should be doing. And suddenly, I heard my friend's girlfriend say the words, look how big his smile is. And when I turned my head over there, the egg finally broke but to my immediate dismay, it was to a reality that I knew far too well. Once I was back in the apartment, I just closed my eyes to try and relish the remaining closed eye visuals I was getting from the drug, and enjoy the remaining body rush that lasted. The swirls of patterns just felt as though I'd eaten a large amount of mushrooms, and the body rush was aching to a small dose of MDA. After mine and my friends' experiences that night, there was always another hit left in the bowl that was used to just keep the afterglow going for a small time longer. I then noticed it was quite late. I stayed with my friend at his apartment until I'd reached my baseline, and then headed home to sleep. But I had a less than resting sleep, and have been sort of in a fog today. Overall, I am very happy with the experience, and it was exactly what I was wanting from a 5MEO DMT trip. I wanted to experience something that was a totally foreign reality, and to be able to take something away from the experience. Though I experienced the first of those two objectives, it is my understanding that the latter is obtained once one breaks through the chrysanthemum, or my green triangle dimension dome room. I chalk this up to me not being able to keep a hold of reality long enough to get the third good toke. I do wish I'd been able to get the third one, and been able to accomplish my mission in one experience. But alas, now I have a reason to do it again. Trapped in two dimensions. 
a salvia divinorum 5x extract and cannabis trip report posted to earwid.org by sam on february 3rd 2021 i smoked about a half gram of 5x salvia in a pipe about five minutes after i decided that the salvia had no effect on me my friends and i the others had not smoked salvia and were acting as sitters decided to smoke some weed i took two very heavy hits from the pipe and disappeared i could still see the others in the room but the dimensions of the room had become grossly distorted. I thought that I was simply stoned from the weed, and so said nothing. Pretty soon, I started laughing to anything that was said, caused by the weed. However, this leads me to my first other world. I was hung upside down with my head resting on an infinitely long conveyor belt. Everything was black, and the conveyor belt was just the outline of a conveyor belt. Two white lines stretching off into nothingness. There was still a small window through which I could see the room and everything else. The conveyor belt was moving, and on it were bumps which were hitting my head at the rate of my heartbeat. My heartbeat had become incredibly loud by now, and everything, my breath, my laughter, was to its rhythm. Someone would say something, and one of my friends and I both started laughing at them. The typical stone laugh where I can't stop. I felt compelled to laugh, because the bumps on the conveyor belt were forcing the laughs out of me looked at my friend and realised that he too must be hung over a conveyor belt in his imagination, and that he too was struggling to get out of it. Suddenly, I was off the conveyor belt and back to a full view of the room. Everything was in two dimensions however. The distance meant nothing any longer. Everything looked huge, and I had no idea how long the room was. I lay back on the bed and felt my legs spanning towards infinity. At that point, the picture started to fragment. It looked as if I was looking at one of those walls of television screens, with each image showing the same thing over and over. I think that the images were still all in two dimensions, but they were rapidly becoming too small to see. I kept zooming away from the wall of screens, which could either look concave and bending over me, or convex, like it would turn into a huge ball of images. It's difficult to say which. At this point, I finally realised I was under the salvia's effects. I felt as if it had trapped me within it. There was a roaring in my ears, and the wall of television screen started to go fuzzy and blur out. Out of this blur, a single small image of the real world, like a window on a computer, began to clear up, and I could see the room again. I managed to force out a call for help in a voice that was not my own. I was really trapped inside the salvia. But I could manage to control the body that was out in the real world enough to call out. I managed to get my friends to call 911 and to splash some water over me. I could feel the water, but it wasn't happening to me. It was happening to that body that was still in the real world. I asked someone to rub my legs down. I can't remember if they did or not, as I could feel nothing. Suddenly, I could feel the cold air from the open window behind me hit me, and everything started to clear up. The room reverted back to three dimensions, and I lay back panting. I started telling my friends what I'd seen, but I couldn't describe it. As I was speaking, however, I could feel myself slipping back in. The three-dimensional images started to slide over each other again, and reverting to the two-dimensional world. My mind was a detached from this world, and I was seeing it all on a huge screen. On a screen, however, things look like they're in three dimensions even though they are in two. This really was two dimensions that I was experiencing. Cardboard cutouts of people of impossible sizes overlapping each other. My location in space no longer made any sense either. I was just here. Everything else was a picture that moved as I moved, and places didn't mean anything anymore. My friends helped me up and moved me down to my room to wait for the police. I was able to walk, but only because I was walking in my own world. I controlled a huge body, detached from this two-dimensional world that I could see about three feet away from me. The steps were easy. They were just a flat path on which I knew to put my feet between the lines. When the police came, my other body knew how to answer their questions, thankfully. I couldn't tell them about the two-dimensional world I was also in, or ask how come 20 of them seemed to be able to fit in such a small room when there were only three of them in reality, I think. I didn't tell them that I was shaking so much because I was scared and panicking, 
though. I was obviously just shaking so much because of the drug. I couldn't believe that the whole world wasn't shaking to my shakes, which I could feel pulsing through my body. I knew how to behave, because I could see myself as others saw me. This wasn't quite an out-of-body experience. Rather, it felt like I was watching the imaginary me, who would be there were he not trapped in Salvia. I could see him watching the real world as if it was on a screen, and answering the right questions. The next thing I knew, I was on a stretcher and inside an ambulance. Since the concept of place meant nothing to me, it wasn't really me that had moved, just the rest of the world. They put an oxygen mask or something on me, and my mouth started to get really dry. Soon, my mouth was the only thing in my body, and it felt like dry rock. There was just my mouth in the world, and the oxygen mask. Nothing else. I started imagining a rocky, desert landscape around my mouth, and don't know now whether I really saw that, or just imagined it at the time, or whether there is even a difference between the two things at all. I have no recollection of the trip from my house to the hospital, though I am certain that I was conscious, in my own way. I remember being lifted from my stretcher to the hospital bed, and then, all of a sudden, there was no one there. I lifted my head and all I could see was the room. The room itself was still in two dimensions, but like a screen that is bent and waving. I realised then that the present wasn't a time, it was a place. We were always in the present, and I could actually feel myself in it. Places from far back and recently were identical, just different pictures that were scattered around. The room and the fourth dimensional impossibility of time started to wrap themselves into a gigantic sphere, which looked silvery and liquid, yet at the same time, I could see every detail of the room and time itself perfectly. My body I couldn't see, but I knew that it was silvery as well. I started to zoom out from the sphere until I was standing on it, standing on all of time and space. I didn't like how this felt, so I let myself slip back down until I was level with the sphere again. At this point, I started to slip away into dreams and visions that no longer had anything to do with reality. I only remember two of them clearly. I don't know if I had any others. One was of a dragon made up of coloured points on a black, infinite landscape. It looked similar to a 3D computer graphic of one, before all the points are connected up. The points at the bottom were red, which slowly changed to gold about halfway up its body, and finally, ended in black. How I managed to even see the black points against the completely black background, I do not remember. There was no emotion particularly connected with this vision and dream. Well, I wasn't even there to experience it. I was simply watching it all from a distance. I snapped back into the hospital, and saw my heartbeat acting crazy on the computer monitor next to me. Someone had stuck a tube in my arm, but I hadn't felt it. I was panting now, and my heart felt like it wanted to explode from my chest. I heard someone say something about my heart beating as if it was from anxiety, and I couldn't agree with them more. I think I may have had an out-of-body experience at this point, Time was still as absurd as space. Both of them just wound back and forwards. I had no idea how long I had been there for, because the clock just kept jumping around. My second dream and vision involved me on a boat in a black landscape again. Black sky, black ground, and black river. Everything was peaceful, and I just felt myself slip away down the river. I snapped out of it again knowing that it was far better to face this imprisonment and anxiety in the two-dimensional world than the peacefulness of that other world. I think I had other dreams like that. Blackness with me slipping away, and I kept forcing myself to snap out of it. One final vision, I only remember a fragment of, came back to me when they were pulling the wiring from my chest. I saw some type of machine man, all in red metal, with a number of tubes and wires that could be plugged into his head. This dream was obviously induced by me having wiring attached to my own chest, I assume. I finally came to at about three in the afternoon the next day. I had to keep touching and feeling things to check that I was back in this reality. The ease at which I could see things in three dimensions truly amazed me. I resolved to myself, though I'll probably not keep this resolution, to do a major on perception. 
Inert God Stuck in Time, a 4ACO DMT trip report by McDoss, posted to Earwid.org May 15th, 2019. 4ACO DMT was my favourite psychedelic, I decided. It was easy to find, it was easy to ingest, and the effects set in noticeably faster than LSD or mushrooms. It was possible I preferred mushrooms, but 4ACO seemed very similar, and to be honest, I kind of liked the idea of being a psychonautic hipster taking a weird research chemical that many people have never heard of. I'd tripped about 15 times before this. Four of those times were on 4ACO, and I was feeling confident with this one. Through a few very bad experiences, both by myself and with friends, I had to learn to respect and to always trip in a safe environment. I lived with a couple of roommates in a large home, and over time, I'd prepared my corner of the house to be as cosy and trip-friendly as possible. Feeling prepared and knowledgeable, I weighed out 55 milligrams of 4ACO on a lab quality scale, which I then deposited into two cellulose capsules. I also measured out a few more capsules for future use as well. I knew how strong this stuff was, but I'd taken 35 milligrams just a few weeks earlier, and I wanted to go a level or two further with this trip. I knew this would be the deepest I had ever gone, and I was ready for it. I pressed start on my phone timer, a ritual of mine to keep myself grounded during the trip. Imagine my surprise then, when two hours and thirty minutes later, I was stone cold sober. I felt a come up, yeah, but I never peaked. At around the sixty minute mark, I spent some time in bed and felt like I was on the way up. But when I got out of bed, an hour later I realised I wasn't actually tripping. I was frustrated and disappointed. I decided to give it another thirty minutes at least, to see what happened. I ate some food during this time but all 30 of those minutes were spent wondering why I wasn't tripping, despite taking a very large dose of a strong psychedelic that was only three weeks old. So at the two hours and 30 minute mark, I pulled out the extra capsules I filled earlier. I grabbed 30 milligrams, downed it with a glass of water, and put the rest back. Then, I sat in front of my computer and watched some YouTube videos while I waited to see if anything would happen. 40 minutes after my third capsule, Something was definitely happening. Like all of my prior trips, it started noticing random things around me that never caught my attention while sober. I felt relieved that I was finally tripping, and I was very happy with my decision to take that third pill. I decided to put on some music to keep the positive vibes going. One of the songs that came on had a female singer, and I was completely taken in by her voice. All I wanted was to hear her speak and sing. I realised I was sexually attracted to her voice. I'd had this thought on other trips, so it wasn't particularly new or surprising, but I wondered how normal it was. Then, I realised that some inflections of her voice made her sound exactly like my long-time girlfriend, whose name is Elle, and that voice had probably been a big part of my attraction to my girlfriend all this time. During this period, I gagged a few times. I always gag a little bit on the come up for psychedelics, so this was nothing alarming. I thought about how tragic it was that I always felt a little sick at some point during my trips, but that ironically, the gags were so familiar at this point that they were almost comforting. I wouldn't normally mention this, but it will be relevant later. I want to point out that no point during the come up did I even consider that I had really taken the full 85 milligrams I had ingested. In my mind, there was no way in hell those 55 milligrams were ever going to hit me with full force. I guessed that the total amount I had taken would probably feel closer to 35 milligrams. I didn't have an explanation for why, but I fully believed that the 4ACO had lost much of its potency. At about the 3 hours and 45 minute mark from the first dose, I started to feel a little overwhelmed. I realised the trip was becoming very strong, and I felt the need to lie down, but I didn't exactly want to go back to my bed. I searched Google for extremely relaxing music, and clicked on a video that showed a beach and played soft ambient music with the sound of waves in the background. Then I wrapped myself in an extremely soft blanket that Elle bought me and tried to relax. I dropped to the ground and squirmed around in the blanket, feeling its softness on my skin. 
I felt extremely comfortable, and I started to feel emotional. I felt like I was a pathetic human being, but that I was so lucky to have the people around me love me as much as they did. I started to feel extremely grateful to Elle, and I started saying, I love you Elle, over and over out loud while squirming in the blanket. Her caring and tenderness were allowing me to feel that moment of bliss. All of a sudden though, I felt very alone. See, Elle and I lived in different parts of the country, and it had been a very long time since I'd seen her. In fact, none of my loved ones live near me anymore. And this realisation hit me very hard. I felt like an idiot, utterly alone, writhing on the dirty floor of his room because he took too many drugs. This lack of social interaction made me feel like I was barely human. At this time, I started to feel sick. I felt like I needed to gag again. I started to worry that maybe I wasn't even human. Maybe I was just a dumb animal who accidentally ate the wrong thing. Did I even take drugs? Maybe this wasn't even a trip. I started dry heaving on the ground by now, and I felt very sick. I would always gag on the come up, but I never gagged during the peak, so this sort of scared me. Maybe I actually was sick. Maybe I was very sick. I started to dread that something was very wrong. I felt flashes of hot and cold, like I had a fever. I knew that people could hallucinate with very high fevers, and I suddenly became very convinced that I might be dying. I got so sick and had such a high fever, that my brain was malfunctioning. I could actually die right now. The waves from the music sounded like they came from all around me, and I realised I was on the shores of death. I was actually dying. I was definitely going to die any minute now. If I didn't get to hospital, I was going to die, but I was completely incapable of using my phone and calling for help. I wanted to be okay with dying, but I couldn't convince myself that it was okay at all. I had too many loose ends in my life. I needed to marry Elle and live life together with her before I died. I couldn't just leave her alone. She'd be absolutely devastated if I died right now. But that's when I realised I couldn't remember what Elle looked like. In fact, I couldn't perceive or remember the world around me at all. I couldn't remember what my brother looked like, or my mother, or even the room I was in. I couldn't remember the last time I saw any of it. All of my memories felt very fake. Everything I could imagine felt like a far off dream that all this time I had forgotten to question. I realised that I had never lived at all, not even a single moment of my life. I could remember waking up from sleep and going to sleep, but nothing in between felt real. Everything felt so dreamlike, like the twilight as you lie in bed at night waiting to fall asleep. Had I ever actually slept? Was anything real? Did I spend my entire life in a dreamy state recalling false memories, waiting for a sleep that would never come? I then had the very strong sense that time and reality were not real. I was a cosmic being, trapped in the fabric of the universe like a single puzzle piece. Nothing had ever happened. It was all in my mind. Reality itself was only ever what I imagined it to be. All of the pain and suffering in the world didn't exist. I just imagined it, which caused it to exist in my mind. Because of this, in a very real sense, I caused all the pain and suffering in the world. I could stop it, if only I could avoid thinking about it, but avoiding thinking of it meant actually thinking of it, so I was stuck in this sort of loop. In fact, everything was a loop, and I existed in this state for eternity, trapped in looping memories from my own mind, but there was no future to speak of, there would never be new memories made. The very few things I remembered were all there was, the universe was hopeless and empty. L did not exist. No one existed. I was absolutely, completely alone. I tried very hard to come to terms with this, but I just couldn't. I felt this unbearable loneliness. I felt like I'd always lived and always would live, completely inert, stuck in time. Nothing would ever change. I felt it was possible that I was literally in hell. 
Perhaps there were other celestial beings who actually had it figured out. They had figured out how to live without time. I couldn't perceive them, because I could perceive nothing other than my own little pocket of dimensional space. I was utterly irrelevant and doomed. I wanted to die, and I wanted everything to stop. During this time, I had a brief moment of clarity. I realised for a moment that I did have memories of taking drugs, and that if nothing else, I might be able to go back to my illusion of a life once the drugs wore off. I remembered that I'd started a timer on my phone. I didn't feel like I could understand the timer if I looked at it, but I wanted to see it to prove to me that the trip had progressed. I wanted proof that time had moved. I wanted proof that this would end. So with a lot of effort, I managed to pull up the clock app on my phone and clicked over to the stopwatch tab. Zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. On some level, I knew I'd stupidly reset the timer at some point, but in this moment during the trip, my mind filled to the brim of despair. It was the deepest, darkest, blackest place I have ever been to in my entire life. I had no proof that time had ever moved. L was not real. Nothing was real. I was stuck. I laid there on the floor, filled with self-pity and hopelessness, for what felt like hours. Then, suddenly, I felt like maybe I wasn't actually about to die. I felt like I could sit up. And so, I did. I managed to stand up, still wrapped in my soft blanket, and I stumbled to the bathroom. I peed in the toilet, but it felt wrong. It was like I was wetting my bed. I had flashes of hope that the trip was over, but then I looked around me and saw the world shifting and morphing and I realised I shouldn't get so excited, because I was still tripping very hard. Except, there was a world around me, and it was real. Reality was real. The realisation that reality was real washed over me like the waves of a warm bath. I looked around me and realised that I didn't understand anything at all. I couldn't tell if it was night or day, I couldn't tell what time it was, and I didn't know what day of the week it was either but I knew that all of those things were real and that I'd be able to know them eventually. I became convinced I was a literal god and if I wanted something, I could just will it to be. It was night and I wanted it to be morning, so I willed it to be morning and it worked. Well, that's how I felt at the time. Obviously, I couldn't actually change night into day, really. I walked around my apartment willing things to be true and each time I willed it, I got the strong feeling I was successful. Eventually, I felt well enough to leave my room, and I went to rest on the living room couch. I realised I wasn't a god, and I laughed at how silly it was to believe that. I still didn't understand time or numbers, so I just laid there, waiting for my brain to catch up while I basked in absolute contentness. Nothing mattered, except that I wasn't a trapped celestial being anymore, and that L actually existed. She was real. Of course she was real. She was real, and I was going to be okay. In the days after the trip, I felt grounded and peaceful. I did not take away any big lessons from the trip, but I felt very emotionally stable and clear of mind. I called Elle, told her about the trip, and told her I loved her. After talking to some friends and others online, the operating theory is that at least one of the capsules took longer than usual to dissolve, and so I got hit with most of the 85 milligrams after I took the third pill. In retrospect, the trip went way better than it had any right to. Because I was calm for the entire come up, and my room was comfortable, I went through the worst of it without becoming agitated or scared. Even though I'd done something risky and a little irresponsible, I felt appreciative to my sober self for taking my past experiences into account and creating a good trip environment. I wouldn't take that much 4ACO again on purpose, but in the end, it was an extremely beneficial and somewhat spiritual experience for me.
My Salvia Trip Report, posted to the Salvia subreddit by Nondil5 two days ago. This happened about a decade ago, but the trip was so impactful that I'll never forget it. I'll go to my death contemplating it all. I haven't shared this trip online before, so here we go. The trip is atypical because it's a positive one, whereas most Salvia trip reports tend to be quite dramatically negative. This trip profoundly increased my overall positivity and outlook on life since that day. And it's also the reason why until very recently, I haven't done any psychedelics at all. I felt I've had enough for a lifetime after this. This was Salvia 60X or 80X. I can't remember which, but it was powerful stuff. I smoked it a few times prior, about 10 times altogether. But I always took very gentle hits. And what seemed to happen was that reality shifted into something else for a very brief moment, and then back again. For example, one time I smoked it around a table with some friends, and suddenly, the entire scene transformed into something where we were all on some kind of beach near the ocean. I looked to the right at one of my friends, and he was wearing one of those old marine captain hats, and he kind of winked at me like a cartoon character. Then reality would morph back to normal, as quickly as it transformed. I had a couple of these kind of trips, with short but still potent changes in perception. The last time I smoked it though, was different. I was alone this time, and I had enough for two to three strong hits. I packed my pipe to the brim, and lit up my torch lighter, really dedicated that this time, I'll feel something stronger than just a little teaser in effect. So I somehow managed to take about three gigantic hits, and put the pipe down. What happened next is hard to convey into words, because words don't do it justice, and never will. A very powerful voice, which seemed to be coming from the back, and the power of which seemed to make the entire world vibrate with enormous force, basically said to me, Hi, I'm Salvia. I don't think it happened in spoken language, but I could understand everything being said with crystal clarity. It felt like a telepathic download of sorts. There was absolutely no ambiguity in what was being said, and even though the transmission was an alien experience to me, and I struggled to get to grips with it, I still understood everything with extreme lucidity. The voice said something like this. Well, you know, every single thing has a spirit. At the core of everything is a specific spirit whose natural expression is that very certain thing. This voice then went on to provide me with a very specific example. I know all this because after the trip, I wrote all of it down. It said, If you eat an orange, the taste that you feel in your mouth is the communication with the spirit of the orange. This was very specific, I thought. Then, the voice went on to say, Well, you just smoked me, and I'm the spirit of Salvia, so this is what communication with me is like. What happened after this is impossible to describe, and I only really have a very shaky mental picture of it, because my ego simply cannot even formulate or begin to formulate any kind of description that would fit the experience, or uncover even the surface layers of just how unbelievably alien it all felt. What happened was I felt as if two enormous hands lifted me from my body, and I went up, up, up through the stratosphere, through the layers of the multiverse, through some kind of membrane, and some type of super-dimensional, non-Euclidean, hyperbolic weirdness of hard-to-describe proportions, until I basically landed in nothing, and there was nothing but love, and nothing there. Love and nothing was the content of this place, and there wasn't even a me to speak of. I didn't exist there. I just somehow was part of this love and this nothingness, and what's more, is that it lasted forever, as far as I can tell. I don't know how I ever got back to my body, because from what I could tell, this was forever. And this is just how things are, and always were. There's love. Infinite love of unconditional and deeply profound nature. And there's also absolutely nothing. And those are the only two things that actually exist. I know this sounds paradoxical, because how can nothing exist as a thing? But that's exactly how I felt. It was infinite nothingness, and infinite love in every direction. 
When I did get back to my body, it felt like I was slowly descending back into my body. And I remember I had some kind of an energetic parachute that attached to my front rather than my back and was made of what I can describe as two enormous rings on each side of me that extended through another reality back into our own. If you've ever played MDK games, it was kind of like that parachute, except it was glowing red and it was on the front of me and there were only two circles instead of four. I remember specifically looking at how the two rings at the far ends poked through some kind of membrane that separated this world and the one I just came from. This experience radically transformed my life. It permanently erased my depression and inspired me to be extremely creative. I've never taken salvia since because I'm afraid it might modulate my life in a different way or that I might experience the horrors that I keep reading about with salvia. I'm not sure it's worth the risk. So there you have it. That's my trip report. Regardless or not if you believe in the spirit world and the spirits or everything described here, you have to at least agree that the orange analogy is spot on. I've never thought before that the spirit of the orange might express itself to you through the experience of eating it. Next time you taste an orange, remember, you're communicating with its spirit. My eight dried grand mushroom trip showed me the stream of all creation and taught me love and forgiveness. A mushroom trip report sent in by a subscriber. For most of my life, I never used any drugs or alcohol. It was only two years ago that I started to dabble in marijuana and psychedelics during a particular low point in my life. I'd lost my business due to COVID. I lost the job I'd gotten right before I started getting treatment for adult ADHD. My wife got diagnosed with bipolar schizoaffective disorder. My mother got diagnosed with cervical dystonia, a movement disorder, and that brought my wife and I to live with her to help her out. I was doing a bunch of side hustle delivery jobs to keep the bills paid, but debt was still piling up with all my wife's new medical bills. I was just angry and depressed all of the time. I was looking for anything to help me at this point, and I took to psychedelics very quickly. My first dose of mushrooms was 1.8 grams, and it was amazing. I spent years prior meditating and reading Eckhart Tolle, Thich Nhat Hanh, and all those other mindfulness experts, but I never truly knew mindfulness until that very moment. 2.5 grams helped me stop fearing death. In deep meditation, I dissolved into the infinite and realised I was nothing but octillions of atoms and would always exist in different forms for all of existence. I tried some LSD and had a magical evening with my wife. Then I did DMT with a friend and got blasted through dimensions, standing naked in front of laughing shadows and entered a palace of moving fractal heads that inside had a being of complete blackness show me all the thousands of lives I've lived and then shot me through eternity and back to earth. I was ready for a real heroic dose now. As a heavier person, I thought 5 grams might not be that much, so I opted for 8 grams of dried mushrooms instead. I sat with my wife, watching the Amazon show undone, waiting for the mushrooms to kick in, with the plan of going to our room with sound cancelling headphones and a sleep mask ready for me. I closed my eyes, and the entire house felt like it was giving me a hug, and that's when I knew it was time to go. I opened my eyes, and the patterns on the walls were climbing upwards and I got up slowly and walked my way to the bedroom. I got under my blanket and put my headphones and sleeping mask on. For 20 minutes, I just laid there watching the most beautiful show I'd ever seen. Intricate, gorgeous fractals and spirals swirling in front of me while my entire body felt like it was getting a massage. Everything just felt amazing. Then, this bright light flew across my vision and a voice said in my head, are you really doing this, or are you just chasing an experience? And this told me I might be in for a big thing. I'm really doing this, I said. The voice said sternly, If you're not going to do it, if you're not going to take it seriously, 
then there's no reason I should bother with you. I said, I'm really doing this. And suddenly, I was transported to a golden river for which all of life and existence and love flowed from. One touch, and you lived an entire life, saw an entire world come and go. Heat began surging through my entire body. Are you willing to let go? The voice asked. Yes, I said. Then let go, the voice replied. I pulled my blanket over my head, and suddenly I was experiencing my own burial. I had died. Usually I'm very claustrophobic, and I can't even stand having a blanket over my face. But I didn't even remember putting it there after a moment. You're not letting go, said the voice. It sounded like it was getting a little angry. It won't be pleasant if you don't let go. I didn't understand, and suddenly the casket I was in was tossed into a wood chipper, and my feet and legs started to be devoured. Panic started to set in. The trip was taking a turn now, but suddenly, my dog pushed his way into the room, and he jumped on the bed, laying beside me. And this was the last thing I'd remember about the outside world. I gave over completely. And suddenly I was thrown back into the stream of life, experiencing all the joy and love the world had to offer, forgiving myself for not being where I wanted to be in life, and realising that none of that mattered. That being angry at what was happening in life was a worthless endeavour, and that would change nothing about the circumstance, that anything bad or painful or inconvenient would never be changed by my moods or my outrage or my anger. If I couldn't change something, I had to accept it, because it wasn't the world doing anything to me, it was just things happening. With this realisation, the being of light pulled me from the lake, and he asked, Do you want to know how to live in this lake forever? I was excited, I never experienced such peace and joy and happiness in my entire life. Whatever it was, I would do it. You must apologise for the wrong you did without wanting an apology for the wrongs committed against you. You must realise that you don't matter, that no person is being mean to you, that their problems are their problems, and even if they take it out on you, it's none of your concern, and no reason for you to act poorly. This was in relation to my mother-in-law, who I had banned from our life after a big fight, in which cruel words were exchanged about how I care for and help my wife deal with her mental health. Now apologise, the voice said. I went through a dozen different apologies. Each time, the voice kept getting angry, telling me that I was doing it wrong. I just kept trying to explain myself, find agreement, just forget about it. And the visuals started getting darker, creepier, more violent. Until I realised I needed to be just fully responsible, and I realised how to truly apologise. The colours began to turn vibrant and we returned once again to this golden stream of life. And then I was pushed back into my own life and my body, and I pulled the blanket from my head and just felt amazing. I had my wife call her mother for me to apologize. I was taking full responsibility now. She called her mother and I apologized. The woman was still herself and nothing was truly mended, but I do feel for her now. I'm not angry at her. I don't hate her, I just feel for her, that she's in so much pain and so much sadness. For the past year since this trip, I've lived an incredibly joyful life. No sadness, no anger, no depression, no fears and worries. Every day is joyful, even the painful ones. Travelling through realms of the unimaginable. A 3,500 microgram, 25i NBO Amitra report, posted to shroomery.org. So let me preface this by saying that I was very young and stupid at the time. I do not recommend taking such a high dose, or even taking this drug at all. This is my third psychedelic experience ever. I was around 16 at the time, 
I was incredibly intrigued by psychedelic substances due to my mushroom and LSD experiences in the past. I had taken four tabs of acid my second time, so taking two tabs of 25i at the time did not seem like such a huge amount, although they were very highly dosed tabs. I was already smoking cannabis the whole time. This is my own homegrown Della Hayes. I put the tabs in my mouth around 5pm. I was sitting on my friend's couch in his bedroom in the garage of his mother's house. I held the tabs in my mouth for about 20 minutes and then swallowed all my spit with the tab in it. I was with a friend and my friend's friend. My friend's friend had never seen somebody in the midst of a trip before. I ended up going outside with my friend and started talking to his brother and his brother's friend. They were very young and had just come back from school. They were being naughty and smoking cigarettes outside my friend's garage. For the sake of this story, let's call my friend Sky. While we were talking to Sky's brother, I started to feel a very strong MDMA-like body feeling. We walked out to the back of his house and played on the clothesline drying rack for a while. I remember being in awe, feeling like Sky was some sort of little genius because he had his shit together while I started losing mine. He also wore glasses. This could also be somewhat why I thought that. This happened some years back, so my memory of the situation is not 100%. At this point, I assumed we smoked a couple of joints. I was quite the cannabis fiend at the time. We went back to his room, and then shit really got real. This was about 40 minutes after that we had first taken the tab. I started to hallucinate heavily. Sky's face was shifting constantly, and there were dragons flying out of the wall. The music was mostly hues of yellow and blue, and felt very crisp. The next six minutes or so were filled with multiple bong hits, and we also ordered pizza in the midst of all this. I remember taking a big hit from the bong, and suddenly coming to the universal conclusion that there is no objective meaning to life. I was profoundly touched by the face of God in this moment. I spent a while trying to talk about my newfound revelation, but I could barely speak English. And then suddenly, I was in heaven. I thought to myself, holy shit, the Christians were right. I didn't know how I got there, but then I thought, wait, to get to heaven, you usually have to die first. It was a very cliche idea of heaven, clouds, angels, golden gates, flying babies with harps. At the moment, I thought that all the lightness turned to darkness, and that I was in hell. It was crazy. I started burning. I was on fire, and it was painful. I fought it off for a while, and then accepted that this was my fate. At the moment of acceptance, I was taken to a place, a dark place. I was acknowledged as accepting my fate, accepting that I would burn for eternity, and saw about 10,000 people all gathering around small fire pits inside dustbins. A couple of people looked at me and shook their heads, so to say that I should not have come there, I ended up gathering around my own little fire pit. I started to come back to reality again, and found myself sitting by a gas heater. I took another couple of bong hits, and I sat on the couch taking bongs with my friend. Everything felt as if it was peeling back. Imagine stretching your face and pretending to have Botox. It felt like every single thing around me was doing exactly that. There was music playing, and I kind of recalled who I was, but I looked at the time, and only 20 minutes had actually passed. I was dumbfounded. This was actually incredible. I just closed my eyes and tried listening to the music. At this point, there was quite literally no difference between a vision with my eyes closed or open. After about five minutes of listening to music, I could see me and my friends sitting on the couch from the third person, and we were then snatched away from that image and taken to a different level of existence. I saw about seven, eight foot tall people sitting around me and playing pool and just chilling, almost as if there was a party on. They introduced me to themselves as God. I was just freaked out by all this though. This was the most scary part. I couldn't speak at all, I was in shock. The one character I was sitting next to said, Oh shit, not another tripper. What have you come here for? I didn't respond though, I was too freaked out. This dude kind of just got annoyed, as if he could see through my insecurities within that moment, and they just wanted to party and enjoy themselves. 
and then there was me, a nervous wreck sitting on the couch beside him and not speaking whatsoever. Then, I was ripped out of this experience and landed back on Sky's couch. But I was not me, I was Sky. This seriously freaked us both out at the time, and somehow I can barely remember. I was ripped out of Sky's body again and put into this collective subconscious. I could see anybody's entire timeline, their entire lives in bubbles around me. I decided to take a look at my own, to analyse it. I saw some memories within these bubbles of my past, and the hard experiences I had to endure. One of the earliest memories was of somebody dying from an overdose. This was somewhat of a tear on my subconscious mind. I had many tears, being stabbed with a broken beer bottle by my drunk mother, witnessing my mother being abused, being rejected by girls in my past, being rejected by friends and other people I liked. All these things felt like gashes on my subconscious, but at that moment, I initiated the healing process. I was also very aware that the scars would not go away, but at the very least, they could heal. I felt as if I was viewing all these experiences from an objective viewpoint. I realised that it was not all done with ill intention, that all these happenings happened because of sickness within humanity, not because of something I have inherently done. It wasn't anybody's fault. It allowed me to not feel responsible for these bad things and I forgave myself and the other people. It was hard, but necessary. After this happened, I somewhat returned to the couch with a feeling of relief. It was truly incredible. I felt like the healing process was beginning. I looked at the time, and it was like 30 minutes had passed. I asked Sky how much longer this would last, and he said six hours. I was a little scared when he told me this. What more could I possibly be shown? This is too much, I thought. I could barely process what had happened at that point. And then, I was ripped out of my body once more, and shown a goddess, but the goddess did not speak. She was the utter epitome of beauty. I took away from the experience that this was meant to be a sexual reawakening. The only issue being was I had not had sex. I was in a realm where I was meant to be renewing my sexual identity, although I barely had one to begin with. It was then that I realised I was thrown out of the realm and brought to a place where I was shown my sexual habits of the past, which were all masturbation. I felt that I had an obsession with coming. It was very strange and harsh to come to this realisation, and I felt dirty about this. I felt like a fiend. I could barely stand to watch the video of explanation in front of me. It would be like having sex when you were not ready. I was not ready to witness this sex show in front of me at all. I was too young, too inexperienced to truly understand or appreciate the burlesque-like light show and sexual energies being displayed around me. I broke out of this realm in a panic and came back to the material world. I was freaked out, crying as if I had just been raped. I was afraid and nervous. And after about five minutes had passed, I had been thrown into another realm and fell into a loop. It felt like I had lost the reason to be. I had lost all hope by now. I had no idea what was happening to me. I was just freaking out, looping with the thought of how I would lost the plot over and over again. Apparently, the friend of Skies was there freaking out as well, because I was just in a coma-like state repeating, lost the plot, lost the plot, lost the plot. Not long after that, I gave up fighting and let go. It was bliss. I was no longer me, and I was no longer in pain. I was just everything. It was a transcendental experience. I have no memory of this, but apparently Sky and his friend thought I was fucking out, so they gave me an SSRI that I brought with in case, and made me drink it down with water. A little bit later, I was almost entirely sober with only a little afterglow. I looked at the time, and it was like 9pm. I was pretty bummed because I came back to reality so quickly. Anyway, this was a very eye-opening experience for me, and I've grown a lot since then. It was my third and almost most intense experience ever. Everything in my life changed after that day. This was a few years ago now, and looking back on it, I was far too reckless. I do not condone the use of any drugs. 
I've had countless experiences after this that have been far less experimental. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the read. Near-death Bromo Dragonfly experience, posted to shroomery.org 12 years and 8 months ago by the user Goddess of Love. First of all, I'll apologise for my bad English, here are the trip details. The onset begins 5 hours and 0 minutes after ingestion. The total duration of the trip is approximately 48 to 52 hours. This story takes place one day on Sunday in September. It's pretty boring that day. So I decided to have fun with three friends of mine. I'll call them A, B and C. I made an appointment with my friends outside in a parking lot near a forest, if the trip goes wrong. 11am. I decided to take a blotter that I thought was LSD. Until the trip began, we rolled a joint of marijuana and smoked it. I spoke a little with my friends, and I told them that I could be crazy on acid, so that it's important to pay attention to me. We decided to take a walk in the city until the onset, to return to the parking lot afterwards. 12am. An hour passes, and no effect of the onset occurs. We decide to go for a bite to eat, we look for a sandwich place nearby. Afterwards we return to the parking lot. 1pm. Two hours later, and nothing happens. I find it boring, and decided to take another blotter. Here was the biggest mistake of my life. My friends are a little disturbed at the idea of taking a second blotter. We're still talking and waiting until the onset begins, and it's still not there. 2pm. Nothing happens yet. My cell phone vibrates and I receive a message from the one who sold me the LSD. The message says, Hey dude, how are you? No problems I hope. Everything going well? From that moment, I knew something was wrong, but it was far too late took the blotters, and all I had to do is wait for them to take effect. While I'm walking with my friends, I notice that the ground began to breathe, and this is when the onset began. 2.30pm. We went to the parking lot as planned. On the road there, the houses began to be in this painting style, as if Van Gogh had painted them. And the more I walked, I had the impression of entering into the world of the Simpsons family. There were flowers, a sky, houses, cars, they all looked like a cartoon, everything being colourful and sweet. It was really great at this point. I really enjoyed contemplating this landscape as it revealed itself to me. On the road I could see strange Egyptian motifs, and sometimes in the sky there were mathematical equations that loomed in. My vision was very sensitive by now. I could see very far distance, and I could see every detail of each object, flowers and trees around me. 3pm. We finally arrived at the parking lot. When I entered it, everything was very mysterious. For example, between the road that separated the parking lot, it was a magical portal where only those of superior minds have the right to enter. This parking lot was my sanctuary. My power is over it, and I can control and manage it in any way I want. The onset was here. Trees strangely looked like those of the game Kirby. It was crazy. I could see every detail of the trees, yet they were very far away from me. I could also control the time, and change the colours in my own way. The blue might be green, the black could be white, etc. As for my friends, their faces were filled with emotions. I could read their minds. One was nervous. The other doesn't seem to understand why I trip. I amused myself with a friend. He was really like Krusty the Clown when I touched him. All these crazy colours began coming out of his body. I really enjoyed that moment. I felt pretty well for the next 30 minutes. I seemed to be having fun. After a stick of wood drew my attention, I took it in my hands and I suddenly found myself in a viking ship. The parking lot itself turned into a spaceship where I had the impression of seeing the water rise from the ground. I shake the stick in my hands to move it and it was really enjoyable. 3.30pm. My friend asks if it's going well. They all remarked that I'm quite pale, and that my lips became purple, bluish colour. But I did not pay attention. I was so good in my own little magical world. 
My friends really want me to go home though. So they forced me to go home because for them, I was going wrong and I was saying some stupid shit. I said to them, okay, we will go home. But then I noticed that the environment became this graying sort of color. I asked myself full of questions. What will my mother say if she sees me in this state? I was supposed to come back home in 5 p.m. On the way, I became psychotic and crazy. It had happened in my street where my house was in. Here, the objects around me in the city had a soul, and items were driven to cry. 4 p.m. So, here's the bad trip. I saw my house all dark and aggressive. My mum wanted me to open the door. The house called me. In the exterior windows, I could see vicious shadows. My friends leave me at my home. I opened the door, and my mother was there in the hallway. I wanted to dodge her and get up quickly into my bedroom, but she yells, Tell me what's happened to you. I heard her footsteps on the stairs, and my heart fluttered at full speed. I also had this strange feeling that I was quickly teleporting to every corner of my room. It was as if my body and my mind wanted to avoid my mother entirely. My mum was there, and she said, Oh my god, look at your lips. What are you doing? She was very upset. I was huddled in a corner of my room. My mother shouted, I'll tell your father about this. In the living room, I heard my father who said, Holy fuck, he's taken drugs, etc. My father came up and told me very angrily, Bastard, little asshole. He wanted to hit me and I started crying. I told him, Sorry dad, sorry, I'm so sorry I took LSD. Excuse me, please. He was so upset and he was yelling to my mum, Call the ambulance quickly or he'll die. He was so nervous and said to me to come in the living room. I follow him and boom, total mindfuck. He gives me water and I immediately spit it out thinking he wants to poison me. My father tells me I was a fucking shit and totally crazy. My little brother freaked me out like hell. He was like, boo, and I was bumping off the fear. There my father told me to sit down. My mother was in the kitchen and she had phoned the hospital and I had to be brought to the emergency room immediately. 4.30 p.m. What I'm going to explain now is very hard to understand. It would really live the experience to understand it. I was in the living room and there I saw my life began to scroll in front of me. I don't know how to explain it, but every step I reached that corresponded to a period of my life, from life to death, I really had a great auditory hallucination from now. For example, my father said, Our oh, son was so good, why has he done this? And when I got up from the chair to go in the car, it was as if I was dead. I was physically dead, but mentally present. When I got up out the window, I really saw the car as a hearse. When I was in my hallway to go towards the car, Opening the door, I saw the neighbours who were sad, and my mum was crying deeply. When I entered the car, my arms crossed like a dead person. I truly felt like I was in a hearse. My mother cried a lot, and I heard my parents say, First we're going to the morgue, or the cemetery. I just couldn't speak anymore. I had this huge body load, and couldn't even feel my body. It was really sad. I really thought I was dead. And then... I saw the steps. I mean, when someone dies, he goes first to the morgue and the funeral, with related friends, family, etc., and then finally afterwards to the cemetery. Well, for me, it was the same. On the way, I saw through the window of the car. I saw my friends with flowers in their hands. They were only pedestrians, but as I said, their hallucinations were so strong that I thought they were my friends. Throughout the way, I saw all the friends I knew, all the members of my karate club, and I really saw the cars of those of my club who were escorting my car to my final destination. Funeral home in the street. I knew almost all of the people there. Some were crying, and I could read all their feelings on their faces. Arriving at the hospital, the emergency room, my father took me by the hand, and I heard the voice again. Come sir, we'll take you. It won't hurt. We arrived at the counter, and there was a waiting room next. I then looked into the room, and then boom, I saw all the people I knew who looked at me with a sad and helpless feeling. Every person I'd ever known in my life. Sadness were on their faces. A medic asked me to sit down in a wheelchair to take me in a small room. If you want, the hospital was heaven. 
and I saw that I had died and had to access to heaven. In the room, the doctor asked me what I took. I replied that I had taken LSD, and then, black hole. A few seconds later, still in the same room, the doctor was gone, and I was on a chair. A voice said, It won't hurt. And here, I thought that they can do nothing, and they were going to disconnect me from the real world. I thought they were going to trip me for life. I told the doctor sadly, But I don't know what death is. Is it going to hurt? I repeat this at least a dozen times. And he said to me, No, it will not hurt. Let yourself go. On the door which was at the opposite, I saw the last ten seconds of my life. Every second appeared on the door. Everything made sense. I started with the joint. I've not found love. I could not realise my greatest dream of my life. Meet Emma Watson. <laughs> Don't blame me. Then I started taking LSD until I die. If you want, you could say that this all started by me taking the joint, so I disobey my parents. I don't know how to explain it exactly, but it was as if everything had a sense, and that it was all connected for me, to my death. I reviewed all the moments where it started. My first marijuana smoking at school, the meeting of my best friends, my first trip of LSD in my friend's house. I hope you understand. As the seconds pass on, heaven grants me the ability to achieve my dreams. For example, to the seventh second, I heard the voice of Emma Watson, who said, Where is he? And then, Oh my god, I actually saw Emma Watson, as in one of my most beautiful dreams. She wore this beautiful white dress, her pretty face looking at me. I took her hand and this time she said, It's only the beginning. And then she disappears with a demonic face. Trust me or not, this is some holy shit. I don't know, it's very strange. In fact, I'm now at a funeral. At that time, I was in my coffin. I could not move or speak. During the last three seconds, this is what I saw. Third second. I heard a crowd cheering, saying it was a beautiful boy. Very sweet, why has he done this? The second second. I see my love. She is sad and puts a rose on my coffin. Someone is next to her. That person holds her in his arms. Then, she disappears. The very last second. I hear my father, and then my mother saying, Please, do not do that. My dad came up to me angry and said, Yes, you are a fucking shit, and smashes me with his foot. Black hole. My mind now no longer exists, and I'm back in the real world. A doctor comes up to me and says, So, it was you who ordered a lifetime trip. It will not hurt. I really feel that he's injecting me with what I think. A lifetime trip. But the doctor actually just comes to check my blood pressure. Boom. The trip starts to become even more intense. The whole room begins to warp and move, and the hallucinations are so strong that I fainted. I have no notion of time right now. Everything is black in my head. But I do not care, I just must be dead anyway. In fact, the feeling of death is not so bad. And here I have some auditory hallucinations that are that big that, that they feel like real voices. I don't know, I can hear some words such as blood pressure, heartbeat, too strong, lose him, injection, cardiograms, constriction, seizures. I heard this fucking crazy scary voice of the mad guys from Who Framed Roger Rabbit saying, You're fucking dead. Yes, you are. I do not know what time it is, but I found myself in a padded room. I was tripping again, but not more aggressive than before. I was lying on a bed. In the room I can see the words, LSD, beyond reality, moving on the wall. I stayed two days in hospital under advanced supervision. After this fucking huge trip, I slept for a long time, with fears and trembling. When I looked on my phone, the guy who sold me LSD claims it was Bromo Dragonfly and said if I was okay, etc. Now, this bastard is probably in jail, because my parents bring me to the police station and the cops take my phone. In conclusion, Bromo Dragonfly is an enormously hallucinogenic drug, very powerful and very dangerous. Doctors have told me they have failed to lose me more than three times. My heart stopped for a few seconds. 
The dose on the blotters were too high. I nearly died from bromo. I'd light mild hallucinations for about one week after the trip as well. Plus I suffer from necrosis on my left feet, but now it's okay. Here is what I have had, or had. Necrosis, latent psychosis, chronic paranoia, heart problem, sometimes I had a peak beat, and split personality. So please be extremely careful with Bromo Dragonfly. And also, thank you for listening to me, and sorry for my bad English. I tried to be as realistic as possible to describe my trip. But trust me or not, Bromo Dragonfly is a total mindfuck. Peace out. Eternal Dance of Beautiful Nothingness A DMT and Cannabis Trip Report Posted by Quantigy to Eerid.org on September 14th, 2010 Let me preface this account by saying that I've had many previous experiences with psychedelics which I believe properly prepared me for my very first DMT trip. This experience occurred this past weekend at the Gathering of the Vibes Music Festival in Bridgeport, Connecticut. My friend and I were fortunate enough to find a dealer in the campsite who not only had some very kind dope, but also DMT, of which we purchased a half gram. Over the course of the last few months, I'd been avidly reading about DMT experiences and was very curious and excited to try it for myself. My plan was to trip on mushrooms that evening and try the DMT earlier the following day. That night, while shrooming, I made a conscious effort to continuously direct strong, positive thoughts towards myself and my place in the universe. I was hoping to cultivate a strong, positive experience with the DMT the next day, as I had read of people having very difficult experiences with the drug at times. The next day rolls around, and my friend and I find a spot on the beach, directly across from the Green Vibe stage where one musical act was ending and other beginning to tune up. I sat back in a lawn chair facing Long Island Sound, and proceeded to prepare my pipe. I was somewhat concerned, because I'd read many people's accounts of the proper way to smoke DMT, water pipes, vaporizers, butane lighters, etc. And I had none of those things, only a very small glass piece and a run-of-the-mill lighter. Still, I could not help but be aware at this point of a strong sense of purpose around what I was about to attempt. It was palpable this feeling that I was supposed to be right here, right now. Using the tip of a pen cap, I measured very approximately around 10 to 15 milligrams of the brownish yellow powder onto the weed in my piece. And then I covered it with another small bud. Since I had no idea what to expect, I gave my friend very simple instructions. Number one, take the piece from me when I finish. And two, if I appear to be in any kind of distress, Say nothing. Just hold my hand. The wind coming off the water was strong, and so I pulled the towel over my head and lit up. I lit the bowl slowly, drawing a deep breath and holding the smoke in my lungs for about 20 to 30 seconds. Upon exhalation, I tasted pot and nothing else. I waited about two minutes, and while I was definitely stoned, I knew I hadn't gotten a good enough hit of the DMT. I asked my friend to sprinkle in some more, and thankfully, he instead suggested I try one more hit first. So I hit it again, and this time, I instantly became aware of a sharp, acrid flavour filling my lungs and nostrils. Believing I'd hit gold, I took in as much smoke as possible and held it for a full 30 seconds before exhaling. I slumped back in my lawn chair and took note of the clear, cloud-tickled sky. About five seconds after laying back, I became aware of a kind of film drawing down over my vision. I recall thinking at the time that it looked like several large paramecians had landed on my eyeballs. They undulated and slid with ease, slippery living pools of near invisible protoplasm, speckled and busy indeed. I watched the clouds and sky from behind this odd primordial curtain, and then became aware of a warm numbness cascading down my cheeks and throat. My heart was beating rapidly, 
and I knew I was on my way. There was no fear at this time, yet there was this idea of fear. Fear floated over to the right side of my consciousness, and I sensed its selfish desire to assert itself. Instead, I turned my attention away, and to the sounds of the band still tuning up on stage. I knew that once the music began, the fear would not have the resources to stick around me, and I would be on my way towards something wonderful. The band seemed to take forever to launch into a song though. I was aware that the noise of the frontman going on and on about how good it is to be here on this beautiful Friday etc etc had taken on a deep vibrating quality. It was as if the sound was being picked up and amplified not in my eardrums but in the very centre of my body and travelling outward from within. My heart began to beat faster and the thought that this band may never play a song allowed the fear to draw in closer and begin to take hold. It was at this time that the music finally exploded out into the air and I experienced a blast off. The numbness that had begun on my face quickly cascaded down the rest of me and I was separated entirely from my physical form. I closed my eyes, but the sky with its glorious clouds remained, but then began to shift and split as a series of brightly coloured spiral fractals spun down from beyond the sky. The lines of this fractal were thin and clearly something small within them, too tiny to see, was moving as well. The cloud and sky space between the fractal lines suddenly darkened and began to pulse with a sickly purple bruised colour. I understood that this was the fear that was still travelling right along with me. The only part of my body that remained was my heart, which I became sure would soon explode. And then, there was a voice. I use the word voice in the loosest sense, for what I really experienced was the knowing of another given to me. I heard it audibly, but felt it just as clearly and simultaneously saw the message as it unfurled on a bright white banner that drew itself across the sick, purple fear expanse, its edges attaching each one of the pretty fractal spirals. Written on the banner, clear as day, was the message you have taken a powerful psychedelic. This message, experienced visually, audibly, and within my consciousness, was undoubtedly female. There was no tone to lend it a friendly or unfriendly disposition, it was simply supplying me with information. I continued to soar forward. Another banner, voice, feeling, delivered by this female voice shot across my consciousness. It said, we want to see you, but you have to slow down your breathing first. Take deep breaths. Upon receiving this advice, I was aware of a new presence of mind within me. While I was primarily in a state of heightened wonder and no small degree of panic, what rose up within me was a kind of no-nonsense, cold rationality that initiated within me a deep, rhythmic breathing exercise that I practiced often in meditation. As I breathed, the pulsing, sick, purple masses of fear began to dissipate, while the spiral lines grew thicker and expanded outwards. I picked up speed and was very, very faintly aware that far below where my body sat, a strong ocean wind was blowing against my face. Suddenly, I became aware of shapes that were attempting to break through the multicoloured surface of the fractal spirals. There was a pushing upwards until finally, out popped a small, perfectly spherical and bright green head. It spun and smiled wide at me. Two of its eyes were just slits of hilarity, before fully popping out of the surface and began to dance along with the music. Then, I spotted another, and then another, and soon, the spiral of fractal completed its formation of an endless tunnel made up completely of these green, dancing men. I was familiar with the accounts of machine elves, but these looked more like the doozers from Fraggle Rock, which some of you might remember. They danced in unison, and began to speak to me. Hooray, you made it! We're so glad you're here. We've been waiting for you to find us again. I simply marvelled at this, and was distantly aware that back on Earth, my body was laughing. Every so often, 
A sickly purple head would pop out of the fractal, and suddenly there would be an angry little man, with a frown made of pure electricity. He would stare at me and say something profoundly distressing like, Now you're dying. You're going insane forever. Your best friend hates you. However, before any real fear could gather itself, one or more of the happy green men would surround the purple guy and kick or karate chop him off the fractal and into a dark center that was slowly revealing itself at the center of everything. As they did this, they would say things like, oh, Don't listen to him, he's just confused. He'll come back understanding better the next time. You're doing great. Hooray. I became suddenly aware of a tremendous insight into what I was actually experiencing. This insight was presented to me, again, through several mediums at once. I was being told it by the green men. I was seeing the truth of it in the pattern materialized before me, as though the mere existence of this image ensured it was true, as well as being struck by a strong familiarity from the experience as a whole. The insight was this. This was the force of the universe, of creation, of everything. It's continuously moving, working itself into higher and higher degrees of consciousness. The images before me were just that, images, created by my mind to give form to what is essentially formless. The green men illustrated this last point by suddenly looking at me and saying, we can be whatever you want, we can be chipmunks and then they became chipmunks. We can be fire hydrants as well, and they all became fire hydrants. None of it matters. It doesn't matter. Hooray. And then returned to little green man. I understood that this dancing, this moving, was really them working towards the higher consciousness, and that back on earth, this gleeful dancing manifested in the acts of kindness, love, and generosity of people towards each other. I understood that our physical reality, including the notions of time and space, was merely a reflection caused by the vibrating energy of this process, and was not real in any sense of the word. The true nature of everything was vibration, and it emanated and danced around a singular point of nothingness. This nothingness, I came to understand, was all there ever was, or ever will be. However, the notion of nothing naturally implies the idea of something. And that is what we truly are. The implication of possibility generated by the truth of utter nothingness. As if to demonstrate this point, I was shown snapshots of events from throughout my life, from infant years to events from that very day. The picture of the event, say for example, the birth of my daughter or me falling off the slide in third grade, would fill my field of vision then it would freeze like a snapshot and grow smaller and smaller until the spiral fractal tunnel returned from the snapshot that was being held in the hands by one of the green men and then they would toss it back into the nothingness see it's just a picture hooray this is all that's real us you the concepts of us and me and the very concept of separation as a whole suddenly manifested itself as a giant billboard, and that too was snapshotted and tossed away into the nothing. This is all it is. Everything is one. You are it. Everyone is. This is it. This insight was celebrated by a massive hooray by the green men, and then they went on to say things like, It's so simple. Yeah, you see it now. We're so glad you see it. It's you. It's everything. Then they all began to simultaneously don these black graduation caps and gowns. They removed a certificate of graduation from behind them, stamped it, signed it, and then held it up to me while giving me a big thumbs up. Okay, it's back to work we go. Let's go. Hooray. The spiral tunnel gradually began to slow and grow thinner. From behind this vision, I began to make out the frail outlines of clouds and sky. The music continued to jam on, and my fingers began to tap the arms of the lawn chair. I was returning to my body. With my eyes now open, I could still see the little green men, 
who continued to dance in circles behind the sky. Faintly, they cried. Come back again soon. We're always here. We'd love to see you. Good job today. Hooray. I sat up and looked at my friend, who promptly said, Fifteen minutes. You were there for fifteen minutes. The very notion of time was still absurd to me, as I still felt primarily within the reality of the spiral truth, as opposed to the physical realm. This euphoric feeling of belonging and beauty remained with me throughout the weekend, though the exact nature and profound sense of truth and familiarity of the experience has begun to fade away. I have, however, continued to have had faint closed-eye visuals as late as last night, two days later. This account I came up with is the best I could surmise and approximate the experience. I cannot wait to go back there again and see some more.